So the ultimate question is, is he gonna be able to get his knights out? Because this is a great example of knights tripping on each other. The knight on a2 cannot move without losing the knight on c3. The knight on c3 cannot move without losing the knight on a2. So they're needed. They're, um, they're just, they're Siamese knights in a way. Like they just needed for the other one to live here. And I guess if you're white, can you consider playing king c2 to b2 to try to get that knight? But I think since you're also in a situation where bishop d6 will come and you lose your h2 pawn, I don't think you're really in time to uh, go for that path. Hello, everybody. Here uh, with Jen Shahadi. Jen, I got a phone call, of course, as soon as we started. You're a very popular person. But Jen, it's a pleasure for me to be here doing commentary with you. Hello. Yes. Actually, I always have my phone off. The only reason I had it on was because of you, Robert. <laughs> I figured you guys might need to reach me. Yeah. But here we are. It, you're doing a double shift, but I'm fresh, Robert. Um, it's the Pacific Division for the Pro Chess League, and we already have some games started. We do, and I'm opening them up and closing all the many games I still have open from the Atlantic Division, but we're starting with the matchup between the Dallas Dead and the San Francisco Mechanics. And there goes my mic. All right. Well, yes, indeed. We've got the Dallas Destiny and the San Francisco Mechanics started. And I think your mic's set up it, again. Yeah. I dr it literally fell out of the, the um, clip that it was in. So it hit the ground and now it's back. This is what happens when you put me on double duty. You know, I just, I start losing it early. All right. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be good, though. It's going to be good weird, not bad weird. Absolutely. Right? It's going to be <laughs> the best. And... <laughs> Um, you know, Jen, are there any matchups tonight that you are particularly looking forward to? I mean, we have this matchup between the Destiny and the Mechanics, but of course we also have the Blizzard Sluggers and the Surfers versus the Hackers and the Pandas and the Kangaroos. Which of those four matchups to you is the best of the night? Well, I am really, you know, I'm always really excited to see those teams kind of on the bubble um, compete to see if they can get in a more solid top four standing. So I'm really looking forward to Minnesota versus Seattle to see if Seattle can creep up and also the San Jose sack hackers, um, sackers, hackers, <laughs> <laughs> San Diego surfers, of course. Yeah, honestly, um, what about you? Honestly, that's a good team name for them with the sackers because uh, Shakir Mamajarov, he's renowned for his sacrificial play. So I think that actually really works out. I, I 
think we should talk with their managers. But I agree with you that the hackers match up very interestingly with the surfers because the surfers have, as always, they rely on their top board in Alexei Drev, except for today because he's not playing for them and they're using this more balanced lineup of Elshan Muradiabadi with Melakachian, John Dan O'Brien, and Craig Hilby. So they're going with that very strong IM board three and four combination instead of having their 2650 board one and perhaps a lower board four. Yeah, that's going to be really phenomenal. I am really excited about that. So, but right now I got to say Jeffrey Zhang, he's really one of my favorites. I love Jeffrey. Yeah. So I'm excited to get to see him play here. Um, I think he's going to be really busy in the next coming month, as I know he's going to be both playing in St. Louis in an Invitational and then also the U.S. Championship. So let's get it, get in there and see how his he's doing in this game against Andrew Hong, which looks like it's a Sicilian. Um, I always kind of feel more partial to these positions for White, Robert, because I always love playing the open Sicilian. And usually when I play the Sicilian as black, I play a line that focuses on a little bit more development like maybe getting out one of my pieces on the king side yeah no for sure i mean <laughs> you look at that king side over there and there's a bishop on f8 and knight on g8 and it's like well is jeffrey ready for the next game but at the same time right jen you get that really solid structure with this d5 and this pawn can go to c5 at any moment for black so you're kind of counting on your the strength of your pawn structure rather than your development which is weird especially for uh, less experienced chess players but you know for those of us who have been playing for a long time and know these kind of ideas it's much more normal right totally i wasn't ragging on jeffrey's opening i'm just saying it's more of an acquired taste it's like you need to be a little bit more if you just throw somebody who's never played this position before um, i'd much rather have them being white than black yes no absolutely and I think the struggle that most players have when they see the white side of this position is like, how do I actually make progress? Because, you know, normally we say, oh, let's make a pawn break or something of that nature. But in this particular position with this pawn on E5, rather than like, you can't go back E5 to E4 to try to take on D5. So that leads you to think, maybe I can move my knight and play pawn to C4. That is one of the ideas often in a position like this. But now it doesn't look like white's in time because you have to move your knight, and that just takes a, a tempo. And then, you know, right now you can't move your knight with this bishop on b4. So it looks like Jeffrey's position is off to a good start, although, you know, white can now play maybe bishop d2 and threaten some discoveries, and that's what was played, right? Because if that knight Right, moves... knight takes b5 is a threat right now, so you don't want to allow that. So I imagine Jeffrey's going to play something like maybe a5, protect the bishop. Yeah, a5, maybe c5, and I guess knight e7 protects that bishop through the defense of the d5 pawn as well because if you take on d5 well then i can take back but i like your moves better jen because if i play knight e7 i think white should play knight b5 just giving mm -hmm. up this knight saying that that bishop is so important to your position and without it you're just going to be in big trouble totally agree i feel like knight b5 is a great move in that spot because it's also going to land that bishop on on a d2 is suddenly going to land on d6 which yep. is one heck of a promotion. <laughs> yeah, that is an undeserved promotion. You know, we, we're all about ha people, you know, climbing up in their workspace, but that bishop needs to work a little harder before it gets there. Yeah, you, you don't get to the corner office that fast, right? Yeah, that's that, that's for sure. That's like, you know, that's like the bit on d6. It just is doing everything, right? It's like the knight on e7 feels uncomfortable. You know, it's hitting the queen on c7. So that would be too good to be true. Although, if you do all these double duty shifts, Robert, I feel like you deserve that kind of promotion. <laughs> well, you know what? D Danny Wrench, wherever in the world you are, if you're listening, I mean, you know, Jen Shahadi is a very, very smart woman. So listen to her. <laughs> Bishop D2 to D6 him. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. That's going to be now my new turn of phrase. And yeah, so Jeffrey, on a realistic note, has some huge difficulty here that he needs to figure out because he's not developed. Queen to g4 at some moment is not going to be particularly pleasant, hitting that bishop on b4 and hitting the g7 pawn as well. So, yeah, the pawn structure might be good for Jeffrey, but at a certain point, you just need to develop your pieces. And taking a look at some other games, uh, let's pop in on Naroditsky versus Emily Nguyen. Okay. Um, Naroditsky playing for the mechanics. Whoa, lots of knights in the center here, but one of them is about to be captured, of course. And... Critical question, Jen. 
How would you decide, like, uh, whichever pawn you decide to take with on the d5 square, how do you come to that decision? Um, well, I guess I would, think a I would think a lot about the potential plans that I have in this position. And also, it seems like regardless of which way I take, I'm going to have to look at the idea of f5 for black. Right. So that's something I have to think about a lot. Is it going to be more dangerous for my opponent to play f5 with a pawn on e4 or without it on e4? Unfortunately for white, I think we have to start thinking a little bit defensively because I don't see a lot of active plans in this position for white. It seems to me that that knight on d4 is a stronger piece than the bishop on f3, for regardless sure. of which way we take. Yeah, no, it's, I think that's really a great point that f5 is going to be black's plan regardless, but is it actually worse for us if that f5 uh, pawn hits a pawn e4, which in turn, like let's say we took on d5 with the c pawn, f5, once we take on e4, now is d5 weak, or is black going to just go f5 to f4, which I think is the better way to go forward, and that we just break open white's king side, and well, now it's a very challenging defense for Emily Wynn. So um, here she took with the e pawn, which I think is well, pretty natural decision. And what's the downside of playing f5 here? I don't see one really. No, I do think that this, well, he's, he's going to repair it. The problem also is that queen d6 also seems cool because um, you don't have to worry about playing f5 right away. White can't even try to pressure the e pawn because the bishop on f3 is also hanging. Yeah. So rookie one isn't going to lead to some anything too, too special. Um, just a really kind of instructive example of a good knight versus a bad bishop, I think. This knight on d4 is truly a beast. Yeah, and it's funny because I say this all the time when I commentate, people always talk about like, the bishop's advantage, as if like it's a given that if you have a bishop or an extra bishop compared to your opponent, it's going to be a good thing. Here, of course, it is not a good thing because your bishop only occupies the light squares, and that knight is sitting on a dark square that cannot be kicked by a pawn. So as you said, this is like the epitome of... Uh, the best knight pretty much ever against a bishop without any clear targets. And that's one thing I like about blitz and rapid chess, that you get to really see these clear strategic themes. Because I think in a classical time control, Emily probably wouldn't find herself in a situation really early on where she has a super bad bishop because she might avoid the situation. Whereas in rapid, obviously, sometimes you have to make quick decisions and you don't get to play your perfect strategic moves that you would play in a longer time control. Yep. So um, really fun, therefore, to the new players who are like, what's all this about um, a good knight versus a bad bishop? Well, you got it right here. And uh, Robert, the game between Steven Zirk and Conrad Halt looks really interesting. Okay, let's it's head. Very double-edged. Let's head right over there. And... I to me, at first, I thought it was like some kind of French, but then I see there's a pawn on e3, so that's not possible. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I had the same reaction, too, because when you see that g5 move, you think it, certainly think it's a French, but it looks like it was just a very peaceful setup for white going, you know, d4, e3, c3, bishop f4. And black said, you know what, if you're going to sit and kind of play what I might consider timid chess, I'm just going to go for it and be aggressive. And Conrad Hill first attacked the queen side with queen to b6 and retreated his queen to c7 and then said like let me go full steam ahead on the king side because you're tied to the defense of your e5 pawn and at first glance i would say that i like black's position because the aggression i think is paying off very clearly that you have all the space in the position you can play bishop b7 and castle queen side and then later determine do i want to play h4 and then play for like rook g8 g4 or play g4 right away to kick the knight away from this pawn on e5. Yeah, I mean, at least I would say if I'm white here and I figure out that you're trying to castle queen side, maybe I can also castle queen side because I'm really scared of castling king side and then you going the opposite direction. So maybe as white here, I need to play a move like queen e2, uh, kind of hint at playing e4 and not 100% decide which way I'm going to go yet. I, I like that a lot because you know, as you just said, if black castles queenside and white castles kingside, and we can just actually pretty much show them the board, then all of a sudden, once this d rook comes to g8, you have the hook. The pawn h3 is what you need to rip open the kingside with moves like h4 and g4, and you're not going to be very happy as your king gets barreled down by rooks on the g-file. But Stephen instead just played e4 right away, which I also think makes a lot of sense. Um, now, after e4 and bishop b7 e takes d5 bishop d5 is there a threat of bishop takes f3 followed by knight e5 well not right away because that rook on a8 is hanging right 
So for the moment, white could still play a move just like queen e2 or I don't know, even c4. What do you think, Robert? C4, I'm always nervous to play just because I just, well, mainly because we just saw the Naroditsky game where knight landed on d4. And so <laughs> I'm like, oh, if I go pawn c4 and I imagine this black knight heading to c6, then the knight's hopping into d4 and I'm not going to be very happy. Of course, that's a bit of a long story, but I do have that in the back of my head. I really like your idea with queen to e2 because it's flexible. You can play bishop to b5 or to a6, depending on how black reacts, or trade bishops on e4. And very importantly, by playing e3 to e4 and taking on d5, your e5 pawn is easier to defend. So I think this decision is a pretty natural one for Zirk in the, in, uh, the current situation. Great. Yeah, this is, I mean, this match so far seems really interesting. And the only game we haven't looked at yet between Cameron Wheeler and uh, Vinay Bot actually seems pretty fascinating as well. Let's head right there then. Whoa. Yeah, e5 was just played. And I see two bishops. And in this case, I like the two bishops. But I also see a bit of an airy kingside for white. And that makes me a little nervous about the possibilities on that side of the board. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's lucky that black doesn't have a dark squared bishop because otherwise I'd be very terrified of having this king on g1. But it still seems, to me, it does seem a little airy for white with no weaknesses. And there's part of me that wished my rook was still on f1 because of uh, the pressure on f7, potentially if the f file opens up. Yep. So, yeah, I, I'm feeling okay about this position for black. It's funny, somebody in the Twitch chat just asked how the bishops are doing today. <laughs> and at first I thought that meant like how the bishops are doing versus the knights today in, yeah. in the because <laughs> we've been talking about that a lot. Yep. But of course they were referring to the Atlantic division, which uh, preceded this one. Yep. No, that's... And, uh, how, and the, how did they do, Robert? The bishops played against the pawn grabbers and they won uh, eight and a half, seven and a half. It was a very close matchup, but they won in the end thanks to Wesley So winning a final round game against Sergey Ehrenberg. Great. Yeah. yeah. I like this and Bobby, move. Fabi had a lot of points in that match as well. He did. He went three and a half out of four, and I think so did... No, no, nobody else did, because Wesley lost his first game to Tuan Min Lee, and uh, he, then he won the next three. So a good performance of Fabiano. Not really a surprise, given how good he is, but, yeah, nice to see if you're a, a Bishops fan. A fan of the archbishops, yeah. not bishops in chess. Well, if you're a fan of the bishops in chess, you will like White's position now for Cameron Wheeler because the queens are off the board, which takes away all of our concerns about the king side, and now you're just playing with two bishops in open space. So I'm really okay. loving White's position here. Okay, yeah, because before I, I somehow thought Black would get something a little bit better than this. I, I don't know. Now, now I certainly agree with you because... I think that you can just play quiet chess, you know, move your king, bishop e3 at some point, even stick the bishop back to g1 if you need to. Yep. And it should be a very long-term advantage for white. Uh, knight b6 was a choice. Let's see if black has anything concrete to try to play against these two bishops. Yeah, it seems apparent to me that black is hoping for like a bishop e2 and okay, but bishop b3, but essentially just stick the knight on c4. That was going to be my point. And well, he's doing uh -huh. bishop e6 anyway. And I really like that decision by Benai Bot because he's saying, please go ahead, double my pawns, and go ahead, take my pawn e5 if you want it. Those, that's not really what's important in the position, it's the activity. And we're gonna get to a position, if those bishops are indeed traded, where white's gonna have a difficult time defending the light squares. We've, you know, if, I liked the bishops a couple moves ago, but I think this move bishop b3 was a mistake. I, instead, I would've went bishop to e2 or to f1, and then challenge this knight on b6 and say, okay, I'm going to go pawn to a5, kick your knight away. You know, you, I'll give you the e6 square for now, but after you play bishop e6, like I said, a5 comes in. I'm gaining space in the position and really challenging black setup. Yeah, Robert, um, I think this bishop e6 move is a br brilliant conception. I, I love it. I, I mean, I love what you said about bishop e6, pawn e6, and then if f takes e5, knight g4 and you're also going to get that pawn get the c4 square yep so what black is doing here they're fight he's fighting for squares because if you don't have good squares for your knights and your opponent has the two bishops you're going to be in a lot of trouble absolutely you need to get some sweet squares for the knights and you know one of my biggest like instructors in terms of squares and when i played in the world team chess championship with yasser uh, yasser sarawan he just like 
always with talking about squares and their value. And of course, I've seen him commentate with you, and you guys have really great discussions about it. But Yasser was the one who really pointed me to be like, you know, instead of focusing on um, you know, what pieces are protected or not and all this stuff, and like in an attack, just look at the squares and how you can envision dominating them. And it was really an informative experience uh, hearing that from such a legendary player. Well, the funny thing about Yasser is I love it when there's an end game like this and White's a little better and he says, White's winning. Yeah. <laughs> and Maurice goes, turns on the engine and is like, it's, it's 0 0.01 or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and Yasser's like, that's wrong. White is winning. He, he does take it a little bit extreme sometimes where he's just like, I know that strategically it should be amazing, but then you turn on that, you know, little silicon friend, it's like zeros across the board and it's like, ah. Uh, just frustration. Yeah, but the, I think what's really instructive about that is if you can see the way that great positional geniuses think and how they consider a position winning that you might just think is a slight advantage and that kind of confidence that you can just drill and drill and drill the position until you win it is actually part of the reason that they're winning these games so often. Yeah. So it's like the overconfidence actually somehow plays into being really great. But let's see what, what uh, happened in some of the other games because we are starting up, I think, another match. Oh, yes, we are. The Sluggers and the Sluggers and the Blizzard have begun their match as Andrew Tang is playing against Georgie Orlov. Um, these games are just in their beginning stage, though. Yeah. We've got um, Fidel Corrales um, against Naomi Bashkansky. And all the games have started. Yeah, so they are underway. They're a couple minutes in, but, you know, the... Blizzard are always like my interesting test case because they're this team that has tw low 2500s to high 2400s. That's how their team dynamic always is. They don't have any GMs that are 2700. That's just not how they go about their business. And Jenna, I just, from kind of a overarching thought, like, do you feel like it's better to stack your lineup or to be evenly spread like the Blizzard? Well, I mean, it depends what you mean because I think with the rules of the Pro Chess League, then it's certainly better to have um, some really, really stacked players just because a rating over 2,700 doesn't count. Right. But if you, if you control for that, if you're saying like once you control for that fact, like if I have a choice between an exact 2,700 or um, somebody, a more balanced lineup controlling for that fact, I think I would go for balance. But because of the rules, I think I have to go with stack. Yeah, it's, it's a great point, and it's so interesting because I'm never sure because the Archbishops have Fabiano and Wesley So. They have two of the top, I don't know, 10 players in the world on their team in the Pro Chess League, but that means they have to put out a 2,000 or so on the last board, and that can be difficult when you're, it puts a lot of pressure on the high-rated players to win every single game because you're more than likely than not going to lose every single game on that bottom board. And that's where it becomes really difficult where you know, even if a 2800 plays a 2520, it's not a sure victory in the same way that it usually is when it, that 2450 plays a 2000. The, the rating gap is more, I think, important on the lower end there than facing the uphill battle uh, against a super GM. I, the only thing I would say is that there's a lot more 2000 players to choose from. And yeah. because people are so competitive about the Pro Chess League, they can go out and find one who's underrated or really good at rapid chess or really good at blitz. Yeah. And that's why I, I would say go for stacks because it's easier to find an underrated 2000 than it is to find an underrated 2500, right? Because yeah. if you're underrated in 2500, then you, you know, you just won't be 2500 anymore. You'll just go up. For sure. And uh, sorry, Jen, I just caught at the corner of my eye this game between Emily Wen and Daniel Naradisky, and it's absolutely crazy. So I let's pop it open. Yeah. That was the one. Oh boy, that was the one where Daniel had the good knight versus the bad bishop. But look at it now. <laughs> now it looks like Emily's got a boatload of pawns. Yeah, how many does she have here? One, three, two, three pawns. Three. And so that means even if she plays me like Queen F2 here, which actually might be the best move, but if she gets into an end game she's the one who's going to be better with so many pawns for the rook. So Yeah, I think so. Um, but what about, okay, so F2 check is something that she might want to avoid. Right. Or queen takes G3. So I like your move. Queen F2, let's do it. Yeah. Maybe, though, uh, Daniel's not going to take on F2 immediately and make her sweat for that a little bit. Maybe play something like 
like, rook e8. Yeah, or even queen c1 or something of that sort. You're right, because the queen is still stuck preventing f2. And the, you know, the two moves that are coming to my mind are queen f2 and queen h4, queen g, or three moves, it's queen g4, because I need to protect my g-pawn, but I'm feeling super uncomfortable about allowing f2 to happen. But sometimes you might just have to be uncomfortable rather than being passive. And that's the trade-off that you always have to consider. Like, does my queen on uh, g4 have the opportunity to s slide in through h5 to g6 at the right moment or to go to e6 with check and trade queens? Or should I be very passive and play queen f2? It's a hard thing Whoa. to consider. Yes, and that's right. And Emily has actually got three minutes here to Daniel Naroditsky's three. And I'm so glad you drew us to this game because I'm riveted. I mean, this would be a major upset if Emily's pawns could break through. Um, to Daniel. And you know, the funny thing is one of her pawns, I almost wish it wasn't there because that pawn on C4, <laughs> I feel like if it was missing, then I, White would even have attacking chances, right? Right. The bishop popping to C4. And she chose queen F2. Daniel immediately rejected it because he thought the end game would potentially be worse for him, I'm sure. Yeah. And played move queen E5. Probably a good move because he's also just angling to get the G pawn. Yeah, and if you're white, probably bishop h3 to e6. Now that your bishop has some new life in the position and it's no longer pinned, just throw that bishop on e6, a much better square, an aggressive square. And she's playing great chess right now. Um, Daniel yeah. Nerdisky last week was the MVP of the Battle Royale. I mean, he was unbelievable in the board one matchups. I think he went six out of seven or something absolutely absurd. So if she could pull this off, not only is she drawing against a grandmaster who's much higher rated than she is, but also one who's been particularly beastly in the pro chess league. Yeah, and I just heard Sam Shanklin, our U.S. champion, rave about Naradisky's blitz skills. So he's definitely feared even by the best as far as blitz goes. Well, now, Bishop, I, I don't know how Emily got to such a good position because it honestly looked pretty dire when we left it. <laughs> yeah. But she obviously fought. And um, let's see now, though, this move, King G7, is, is that a good move? Because now Bishop E6, he, he can even play Rook H8 at some moment. Yeah, I guess he's trying to... Keep, he's trying to keep his options flexible, which is a very good decision. But if I'm white, I'm also thinking about playing c6. And that way, at least my pawn is like one step closer to promoting. And the bishop on h3 is perfectly in place to, to help this, right? If I go c6, now your queen has to stay put protecting the c7 square. Otherwise, when my pawn goes to c7, I'm ready to go promote. So uh, it's very interesting here to see how she'll continue. She played king h2, which makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, it's just defending the bishop, but now queen e2 might be a problem. Queen e2 has to be reckoned with. I think she didn't want to allow something like c6. There's always this queen a1 check that can be kind of annoying yeah. in some situations. But I'm worried about this move queen e2 that you mentioned for her because, of course, she can't take. Then that's just going to be a runaway queen. And so that's going to force Emily back to g1. She'd have to play king g1 in response to queen e2. And then she loses that c4 pawn, which is actually pretty important in this position because then the d5 pawn feels a little bit weaker. And yeah, you know, you don't play king h2 with the idea that once queen e2 happens, I want to go king g1 back. I think she was a bit nervous about her position. Uh, she, you know, she knows that her position has improved since that knight was on d4. But now, you know, she made one little error here, and I think that's going to be all, all Naradisky needs to take this point home. But still, his king's yeah. not super safe either. So there are some chances for her still. But I still think we should maybe move to another game because yeah. I think Black's going to win this now, likely. Yes. Whereas the other games are also kind of in bullet mode, including um, a, a pretty uh, messy game between Zerk and Halt. Okay, let's go right there. Whoa, that pawn is on F6. And... It was on F4 like a few seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> it just went from F went F5 and then, oh, it attacked the queen on C7. So that pawn to go to E5 and F6. And even material, black has better pieces, but white has the best pawn. So it's an interesting dynamic here. And the G4 pawn can be captured at some moment soon, perhaps even now. Is that F pawn going to last? That's the real question. Well, the F pawn has just gone from F4 to F7, man. We're talking about <laughs> promotions here, Robert. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing holding that pawn back except for the fact that there are three pieces covering the F8 square. So I think it's done its job. It's going to be stuck on F7. It's going to be parked there for a while. Oh, bishop h4 wins the rook on d8. So this was a queen f6 was a big blunder. But, but wait, no, the, this queen f4 check. Did I blunder back? Yeah, queen f4 check seems good. Uh, ah, yeah. whoops. That's OK. Yeah, we, I mean, we all blunder. Actually, bishop h4, qu queen f4 check, knight d2 might be good because I have a really annoying threat to go pawn g3 if you go rook f8, which is super weird. 
but um, well, he didn't do he it. He just took twice on C6 as, um, yeah, somebody doesn't, Conrad only has 16 seconds left, so yeah. he's forced to play very quickly. And now Steven's back on move. Ooh, queen, uh, you're queen takes G4 now, Queen takes G2. There's Queen takes D7 check ideas. Ooh, nice move. That's a beautiful tactic. That's got to be, that's fun. That's there it is, queen g2. Oh, no, he did it. Oh, he no. played queen takes g2. Here comes queen takes d7, or f8 equals queen first, actually. Maybe that's better. Yeah, f8 equals queen, actually. So he took on d7 first. King takes d7 to get a queen. Well, I'm so confused by this position. Take well, we're up a piece for a pawn. Yeah, yeah. Now, now we are just should be cruising. But somehow, if I could have... I don't know. I feel like there was an opportunity there for Black to escape, but perhaps not. Just, yeah, I, the tactic looked overwhelming, and here, well, and White's gonna win. Um, well, yeah, it looks they sh White should win here. Um, knight d2, try with the idea queen g3, knight e4, mm -hmm. um, forking the king and the queen. Yep. So, yeah, this looks like it'll be good. But let's take a look at Jeffrey's game. 13 seconds left for each player. Whoa, and so many pieces on the board, and that's pawn e5. Finally, we talked about it a long time ago. Well, not quite. This is going to go down, but f4 comes in. And now queen takes h3, allows rook h8. So it didn't... Well, oh, look at that. Went d4 to get the a7 pawn. Sneaky. Oh, God. And now, do we have time for d5? D5? Ugh. I wanted to promote that pawn. Yeah, that pawn was going right to d6. Now, all of a sudden, all of white's pawns are going to be lost. f4, d4. This doesn't look very good. No, it looks like Jaffrey is getting the better of, of, of uh, Andrew at the last minute. Rook h8, probably even better technique, um, stopping queen h6. Yeah, so three seconds, two seconds. Cool, queen d1, queen takes f4, free pawn, hitting h2, winning d4. Oh, wait, rook takes h2. Rook takes h2. Yikes. And there it is. And there, Jeffrey Zhang has won the game. Um, Let's go to the remaining game between Emily and Daniel. Wow, this has been a very heated round, hotly contested. And right now, Emily is, well, she traded queens. That can't be good. Yeah, she's lost, Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately for her. For Emily. So that means that we got a win for Steven. Yep, and a win for Daniel. That game. Yeah, we saw that, that, that nice queen takes d7. And a win for Daniel, so that'll be... Um, two and a half in favor of the mechanics. Yeah, a good opening round. That This round could have gone either way, clearly, right? Like, all these games were very back and forth. Both players had chances. Um, but Naroditsky can breathe a sigh of relief here because he's going to go on and win this game. And Emily should be proud of herself because, sure, you may lose the game and that stinks. But at the end of the day, you played extremely good chess against a player who is very highly written. Actually, she's doing her best to not go down yet because now Bishop F1... That if she can get that f3 pawn and put her bishop on b5, she has some shot to hold on to this game. Ah, good point. Yeah, I was just about to tell you, Robert, that I don't that these young, talented junior players usually don't like it when you tell them they should be proud of themselves for a draw. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, get out of here. Yeah. But maybe, she, I mean, for a loss. Yeah, but yeah. If she draws, then she will be proud of the epic fight. Honestly, I'm proud of her just for how well she's fought because. In chess, obviously, like, there's a psychological component where you feel like things have been going your way, you get pretty amped up, and then all of a sudden you feel really just like you, like, you collapse psychologically because you're like, oh, I just blew everything and that, that was terrible. So I think she's done well to keep her nerve here, and she's still in this game and it's moved 72, and she could have lost 25 moves ago. But instead, she's really making Nerdisi's life difficult. But I think finally, you no know, King F2 here, if you go King to be g4 at bishop d7 check so now so quick robert come up with a game you lost that you're proud of a game i lost and i'm proud of um wow this is hard let's see 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 it's hard wow this is difficult because it's so <laughs> much easier to think of the games you, you didn't lose obviously <laughs> uh, i'm sure there's yeah. one somewhere that i can come up with i i will All say right. i'm more proud of a well-played game that i lost than a terrible game that i won oh no she flagged she flagged okay well GG, yeah. as we head over to the games between uh, the, the, the other matches, Renee, that still that started playing the Sluggers and the Blizzard, as I imagine. Yeah. We're going to start the third match pretty soon, too, the All-California battle between San Diego and San Jose. Yep. 
And I pulled up the game between Naomi Bashkansky and Fidel Corrales. That's board one for the Blizzard and Fidel Corrales, board four for the Sluggers and Naomi Bashkansky. And I really like Naomi's position. Speaking of, uh, is she, she a junior player? I don't know how old she is. Yeah, she's, I don't know her exact age, but she's a junior player, yeah. Well, she, speaking of j junior talent here who we shouldn't be proud of them for just playing well. We, they have to get results. As, you know, I get it. But right now, yeah, she's born in 2003, it says. So she's just 15 or 16. But her position actually is quite pleasant in the white side of the, what stemmed it from a King's Indian defense. You know, I really yeah. like her center, the fact that she can, you know, she's already pressuring this F6 square. If black moves away, let's say knight to D7, then I'm really worried what happens when white plays F4 and tries to go F5 and just crash through. Do you think this is an example of the superfluous, the dreaded superfluous knight in that she has this beautiful knight on e4, but the knight on g3 is not really that useful except for supporting the knight on e4. And of course I'm uh, referring to, for those of you who don't know, I'm referring to this kind of concept coined by Dovoretsky about two knights that kind of trip over each other because they basically both want the same square. Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, she could have actually played knight g to e4 on the previous move, but she chose to move the C knight instead, and, well, I definitely would have been more in favor of moving that G knight. So, yes, I do think that the knights are tripping over each other, and that's why I would say black should maybe not take on E4 and play a move like knight to D7 and you know, meet F4 with F5 himself. It looks very structurally bad, but at the same time, you do have this light score bishop that's covering the E6 square, and it's not very clear how white makes progress either. Shout out to the chat on Twitch because we don't have four matches uh, started yet. I can give a couple of shout outs. Of course, big hello to Anna Rudolph, who says, well played, Emily. It's always great to have Anna on the chat. And of course, she's one of the main commentators here at the Pro Chess League. Yep. Uh, I think you're going to be streaming with her next week. I think maybe Thursday, actually. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, God, this week. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Warrior Reno said, what's up with girls with red hair and being really good at chess? Love it. Thank you, or you now. I agree. <laughs> I, I think to claim that you started a trend, Jen. <laughs> yeah, Judah Polgar, um, certainly. Yeah, why aren't there more girl redheaded with a... Uh, I mean, Judah Polgar inspired so many top female players to be super aggressive, but... How many, like, uh, how many redheads can you think of in chess, period? Not many. I, I mean, we're, it's a dying breed, right? <laughs> dying. Uh -oh. They have a convention every year in like Amsterdam <laughs> because it's a recessive gene. Yeah, that is dying out. It's true. Um, you know, one of my best friends, Zach Wiener, is a redhead who is also you know a twenty one hundred chess player, um, but his hair is much more orange than it is red. So I don't know, you know, if that really counts. Is there like a distinction there? Oh, it totally counts. It totally counts. <laughs> Probably this redhead convention is good because redheads meet each other and then they're more likely for the re <laughs> recessive gene to carry out, rather. Yeah, Sam Kopich is Ginger GM. I guess I can think of. Um, oh, of course. Vladimir Ginger Potkin GM. as well has uh, orange hair. I was thinking hair. of women. I thought you meant women. Wait, is Anna Rudolph a blonde or a redhead? Let's see what she classifies as. I think it's, it's, it's in between, right? Strawberry blonde, right? Anna, you're, we know you're in the chat, so let us know what you think. <laughs> Come on. Come on, she Anna. We don't want to answer for you. She's so good. She gets she's both. <laughs> um, it's like the people who play E4 and D4, the best of both worlds, yep, right? Absolutely. Um, what do you think? What other game have we not looked at? Well, Andrew Tang's game we should probably okay. keep on, as he seems like he's likely to get into time pressure. He's so got only two minutes to Georgie Orlo's near 10. Yeah, how does he have so much time? That's kind of crazy. But if we know anything about Andrew Tang, it is that he is a speed chess monster. He's uh, more than capable of handling himself with just a few seconds on the clock. And maybe it's too much time. It's trying to give all his time away so that he can just play bullet chess. But here with the black pieces, um, I think he's probably slightly worse. The move knight b to c5 certainly comes to mind, trying to anticipate you capturing this pawn on b6 with a knight d7 huge fork. So definitely an yeah, option. I think he that's exactly what I was thinking, that it's like he's slightly worse because of that. And I don't feel like this is a superfluous knight case like the last one we looked at, Robert, because the knight on d3 is doing a couple things. It's it's attacking b4 and it's suppressing the move e5. Right. So it's like, yeah, they're both hitting the c5 square, but the d3 has a lot of other functions as well. Yeah, that's a great point. A really great point. And that's actually, 
you know, it, it goes to show that you know, just because knights may seemingly trip on each other doesn't mean they're not doing their duties elsewhere. And here, knight to c5. In fact, I don't know which knight belongs in c5 now. It's a good question because whichever knight goes there, you, yeah, you put the d knight, that opens up an attack on the a6 pawn. The bishop on b7 is hanging. The knight on e4 can be captured. So, um, you know, Tang had just made this move, rook to d6, and maybe that wasn't the best move to allow this knight to come into c5. I think that was probably think an oversight. And he's taken, but then what's his plan? Do you th is there any way he can... Oh, I was wondering if there's any way he could sack. Um, but no, he just played the immediate rook b8, and now his, his concept is that he's going to win b6 back ultimately. Right. Uh, he's still not threatening rook takes b6 because of knight d7, though. <laughs> That's such an annoying threat, just a knight just spying on that square with uh, a nice little fork. But, you know, white can just take on b7 and take on a6 and then go into an opposite bishop ending and probably claim an equal position, but we'll see if Georgi Orlov is playing for more here. I mean, he has a lot of time, so he can sit and calculate for a while. Meanwhile, Mikulovsky and um, Georgiev have already drawn their game, so we don't need to look at that. But we've got a one game we haven't looked at yet between Beardson and Petrosian. Beardson is looks, such a beast. This looks like a fascinating position. What's going on? Is White just up a queen? <laughs> yeah, White's up a, a queen and promoting... <laughs> The A and B pawns. Wait, why is this game still going on? Yeah, I don't know. How did this happen? So I'm moving back. Wait, what, that queen was lost a long time ago. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to move 27 just to see where this happened. And, oh, the, knight, the queen just got trapped over there. It, w it was on H4 and G4, and then a timely F5 simply trapped and won the queen. And so <laughs> Tigran Petrosian has not resigned and is continuing to play on, but... Okay, as we it's see gonna it. Re he's going to resign soon, though, because now 97 checkmate is inevitable. You, yeah. can't, get, you can't stop it. Yeah, that's it's the, over. And that's a pretty checkmate, by the way. That's, it's not one you see every day. No, it's forced mate. I mean, the only move you have to prolong the game is rook b7, right? Rook b7 or pawn f6, I guess, but yeah, neither is an attractive option. Oh, right, pawn f6, and then, <laughs> then it does... Well, Pawn takes f6, knight takes f6. Yeah. La you last a little. Oh, see, I was wrong, Robert. Oh, you were wrong <laughs> about finding a, <laughs> finding a, a move that let you survive two moves longer than the others. Yes, so Beardson, this is, again, the evenly matched lineup. When your 2476 board four can beat the... Oh, is it board four or board three? He's board uh, four. Yeah, when your 2476 board four can beat the GM 2600 on board one, Goes to show the power of the balanced lineup. So. And uh, Anna has clarified. She says, great topic. I think I'm both ginger with blonde highlights. Well, we didn't want to claim anything other than you being a strawberry blonde, right? So you were right, Jen. And a very strong chess player. Yes. I just gave a, I just gave a talk at UPenn where one of the students asked me about why when we talk about female players, we're always... You know, when, people, when you talk about female and male-dominated worlds, they always start talking about how they look. Yeah, which is and terrible. So, here I am, guilty of it myself. <laughs> well, but. it stemmed from a totally different conversation, right? You weren't, exactly. We weren't talking about Anna in the context. You know, we weren't talking about her and just opening with it. We were talking about redheads because someone made a comment. So, yeah, uh, but I, I definitely agree with that. That is a big, big problem and just in the world in general where uh, we defer to speaking about looks rather than about strength. And that's just awful and well I do a lot of commentary with some great female hosts and I never hope to objectify anyone in that way so yeah okay I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it I'm the, one who's, I'm the one who's messing it up no you know feminine. we'll give you a pass here you're you're a uh, you're, you're great for the world of chess we all love you so oh see I'm, I'm my cheeks are getting even redder <laughs> I put on too much blush so now if I blush it it doesn't even really look like anything. It's okay. It's going it's to match your hair. So, you know, it's all good. Let's take a look at this game um, between Orlov and Tang that we, we checked in on a while ago. And it's changed a little bit. Yeah. And good. So there's going to be some tactics on E6, good movements, right? Good movements for Tang? or do you? Because before it was like these really, these really feisty knights. And now it uh, still looks like a strong position for white, but it has black made progress. On yes and no, and the reason I'll say no is because I liked when that pawn was on f6, having the potential to play for f6, uh, pawn to e5, and then recapture an e5 with a pawn, and just try to like push my center. And now with my pawn f5, I'm never getting an e5 in any meaningful way, so I think that like 
once the b6 pawn falls, the king of seven is a good move, uh, but once the b6 pawn falls, we're just, you know, white can park that bishop on d3, and, well, there's no real harm there. I guess you have to figure out a way to do that um, precisely because the c2 pawn is under attack, and yes, black is go definitely going to take that pawn rather than the b6 pawn right away. So I would go about trying to protect my pawns, uh, but maybe g4 is an option here. That way, uh, at least you're countering the threat of c2 with threats on f5 and d5 and e6. So I guess it's uh, an interesting position, but yeah, Tang is doing fine in my estimation. Even, even more interesting, I think, is Naomi's game against Fidel Corrales. You said earlier that you like the underdog's position, Naomi Bashkansky, young player on the Sluggers. But I like it even more now, Robert. It's beautiful, yeah. But they're playing a bullet game, so let's see what happens. Uh, Naomi's just flashed out with the move b4. Seems like a really good move. Yeah. If you take, I pressure the d6 pawn. If you don't take, I take on c5, and now I have a really nice pass pawn on d5. Yeah, this is a tough moment for Fidel Corrales because in a position like this, if you're in a classical game, you'd really be sitting and thinking, like, what minimizes the damage in a position here so I can actually play and not just really suffer? But you have a minute and 50 seconds of counting down, and you're like, well, do I play bishop to f5 or pawn to f5? But if I play pawn to f5, does that actually really gain me anything? Is trading the darks for bishops okay? All these thoughts have to run through your mind and run through your mind very quickly because you don't have enough time to calculate everything. I think her position is excellent. She's been dominating this game from start to the moment we're at now. And, I mean, this is really a master class in how to handle the white side of this same ish in the King's Indian. You just keep putting pressure on your opponent, you gain space, and any move lashing out for black has a downside. So playing f5 makes your dark squares permanently vulnerable after the knight comes to f2 and maybe goes to h3. So I'm loving her position. Jen, do you think she's going to be able to pull it off? Well, the longer Fidel thinks, the more I think so, you know? I, 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 I mean, I like, now she's got twice as much time as him. Her position is just fantastic. I, I, I would go with yes. I, I'd bet on her in this position, I think. Um, like an even money line. Yeah, I mean, well, the, the, the clock situation is getting better and better. The position, oh, now that he took on B4, yeah, my uh, thoughts are definitely going up. I would have played B6 or something like that before taking on B4 because now A3 is hanging, D6 is hanging. Yeah, it's not looking pretty. I mean, he must have had some kind of specific plan to go in for a long think and then play that, or is he just going to scurry back with bishop to f8? Oh, it looks, that hurts to see, you know, just... All of your pieces going backwards. What about bishop f5? Getting a little bit of activity so that the bishop d6 is not on the menu because I could play bishop takes e4 or something. Yeah, bishop f5. I guess knight e6 is, is a plan right now that's possible to play because I don't mind giving up a pawn. So knight e6, take my... Uh, if you take my pawn on e6, I have knight c5 at the end of that variation, I think, which is because your pawn d6 is pinned to your rook on d8. And so knight c5 forks the queen and the rook. So there's some tactics at play here. She played c5, which, okay, is, can't be complaining about that move. Knight takes c5 now, and still, you know, this black position stinks. I mean, <laughs> I was, like, trying to... Tell us how you really feel, Robert. I know. I was By the way, good night to Anna Rudolph, who said that she's uh, saying bed bye, but she'll be on the stream with you on Thursday. Oh, have a great night, Anna. Sad to see you go, but, yeah, you should probably sleep. It's late there. Um... Yeah, yeah, but you're, you're, you're leaving at the right time. You're, Naomi is in good hands here with her position. She's trusting her hands, and that's uh, pushing that deep on feels like a good step. She could just play knight to e6. Just, I would play knight f e6 right now. Oh, Jen, this is really tough to look at for Fidel Corrales. But we have to look because it's an upset victory potentially. Look at this, 500 points. I mean, this is, this is un... Yeah, this we can't ungo awayable. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the right yeah, word. I mean, that works for me. Ungo awayable, I like it. And <laughs> Sam Copeland, I know you're always watching, but Sam, <laughs> keep an eye on this game here because this is a really phenomenal showing by Naomi Bushkansky. And it's just a matter of technique. It's and staying calm here because she took on G7. Okay, that looks good. Now she can play D6 or she can play Rook to E1. She has choices. And just, you know, if you give Black several moves, perhaps Black can get back into the game. But for now, if you keep up, you keep that foot on the gas pedal, play rook fd1, which in turn, you can push d6 now or in the future. You don't have to rush that move d6, and I think that's the point I'm trying to emphasize. So you're saying n not d6 right now, play rook fe one first. <sighs> it's hard to say. I, the reason why I want to delay d6 is because once my pawn goes to d6, my a2 pawn perhaps is a little vulnerable. So 
that's the one reason I wouldn't play it so quickly. But here, show knight b3. Okay, now a2 is not going to be a problem. Uh, but bishop c2 for black is definitely an option, trying to take that knight away from b3. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that this is over because it, now note that Naomi has less than a minute or a clock too. There's yeah. no way that this is going to be easy, even if it was grandmaster versus grandmaster. Right, right. But it, the definitely the the potential upset is very much there. Yeah, absolutely, because there's so many pawns hanging for black too. H4, A3, B6 is on a dark square that can be attacked at some point. Okay, rook B1. She's playing. Sure about she's playing too defensively, Jen. Yeah, that rook B1 seemed a little off, but maybe, I, yeah, I don't get that. Well, queen takes B6, she got B6, yep. but that H3 weakness now gives black some chances of his own. That, that's a little bit of concern. Counterplay everywhere now. Yeah. So she tried to plug it with knight C5. Understandable. Yep. Knight takes E6 check. So queen A7, just pin that knight probably. Oh, she went, she retreated. Okay, I, that makes sense. Covering A2 pawn. Um, ah, but anything can happen now. <sighs> yeah, it's making me nervous here. Take on e1, the queen. a2 was hanging. Okay, but f3 is uh -oh. also hanging. But knight f3 now is coming into the position. How can she hold on to everything? Has things turned around? Yeah, this is now really good for black. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is a problem. Import queen g2 mate. No, checkmate. By, sorry, I, I'm sorry, Fidel. I know Fidel also. Great guy. Yeah, he's awesome. Minnesota Blizzard. But it's the upset we were rooting for, and of course the young, the young woman who will, I'm sure, have many bright things in her future, but did not get the upset done today. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, though, Andrew Kang won that game. Okay. <laughs> Remember that game where we, it seemed yeah. like he was kind of suffering? Yeah, so you know, things don't always go according to how they seem like they should, because this game looked like Naomi was in the driver's seat, and unfortunately for her, well, she might be just be too young to drive. That could be part of the problem. But, uh, yeah, she lost, and Andrew Tang won. So that means the Blizzard had a great first round. They won three and a half to half, and it really could have gone very differently. Yeah, some really exciting games there, as it looks like we also have the match started between the Hackers and the Surfers. Yep, and with some very familiar faces. In that matchup, I see that uh, Christian Chirilla is playing as Melikachian. You see, of course, Shakir Mamajarov. He's playing against Craig Hilby, and that's one of those matchups where Hilby is a 24-20 rated um, IM, and that means he can pull off an upset against someone like Mamajarov, but not in this position. It looks like he just blundered a pawn. Wait, where did he blunder? What oh, happened? Oh, no. Did he? Yeah. Wait, yeah, he blundered a pawn. Okay, I'm not making things up. The, the knight on d4 is hanging, so once you play e takes d5, I have rook takes e1 check, queen e1, and bishop takes d4, and black Oh, rook. I see. He literally just blundered a pawn yeah. as we came to the position. Yeah. Well, we're bad luck for Craig, Robert. Yep. <laughs> knight takes d5, nice little tactic. Yeah, you just got, um, it's you're right. overloaded queen, right? Has to protect the rook, yeah. has to protect the knight, and unfortunately, he's having a hard time doing both, so. Ugh. That's a little bit frustrating for Craig because obviously I'm sure this is a really exciting opportunity for him to play against one of the best players in the world and wanted to, to show something. But, hey, it happens. It's, that's why it's rapid. Yep. You know, and it's funny because I, I was just doing commentary for this champion showdown and everybody was getting on. You know, everybody, when you're playing rapid, everybody gets on people who are slow. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, they're slow. Why don't they just move faster? It's so easy. Just move faster. And, you know, Wesley came to one of the interviews and was like, well, it's hard because if he moves really fast, then he blunders sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, the point of the, it's not like they're thinking for no reason. They're thinking so that they can make fewer mistakes like this one. Yeah, and it's very easy to, especially in the quick time controls, to criticize people when you're, people are at home sitting with their engines on and like, look how quickly I know the best moves. Like, yeah, because the machine just, you know, spits out some variations and it tells you what's right. Whereas when you're at the board, there's, I mean, A, we're human, and B, there's just so much pressure, right? It's a pressure that you don't feel. And I always tell people this, like, it's much easier for me to commentate than to play because when I make a mistake in commentary, okay, I made a mistake and so be it. Like, someone will point it out, I was wrong. I'm not a perfect human being. But when I play and I make a mistake, it's like, well, I just lost that game because I messed up and now I feel, you know, much more responsible for, you know, what's just transpired. So it's, it's a much different feel. Especially in a team event, it's really tough. Lots of pressure. Uh, let's take a look at two, two super great guys in the world of chess, Melik Kachian and Christian Carilla. Christian Carilla recently signed on 
to um, be the basically the grandmaster in residence, the program director of the Mizzou chess team. Yeah, so I saw that's that. very exciting. And I was wondering actually, so that means Mizzou is going to be a direct competitor with SLU in addition to Webster. So the uh, Missouri just has all these great chess programs now with Alejandro Ramirez being the coach of St. Louis University and Susan Polgar, the director and coach of the Webster team. It's just amazing that Missouri has become the mecca of chess in the United States. Yeah, it's so exciting. And it, it, this role is so perfect for Christian, the count as he goes by, um, because he's, Mizzou is so much about sports and yeah. Christian is also into fitness and sports. So I think it's like really perfect for him in particular, kind of get our game more respected for the sporting elements, which is exactly what the pro chess league is all about. Yeah, for sure. No, and he's a very hard worker, of course. And so, yeah, definitely a huge get for the University of Missouri. Now, what is going on over here in this game? It's probably not the most thrilling one. I mean, White's got a little something, something, right? Space advantage, but weak knight on b7. But on the other hand, um, the more these minor pieces come off the board, the more you start to think black might be able to get some kind of play against the pawns. Yeah, those hanging pawns, right? They're the nemesis. I think the hanging pawns are the biggest nemesis of players in like the expert and low master range. I really think that it's something that is hard to really conceptualize. And so they see these pawns like, well, my pawns always feel weak. I, and I've heard it so many times. They're like, well, look at my pawn C4. Yeah, there's a knight protecting it, but you know, maybe my opponent just pile up pieces on it and then I'm gonna lose the pawn. And it's just something that you have to become comfortable with. And I think in this particular position that um, the pawns are doing just fine because you can always also play the move d5 for white to trade off that d pawn and your rook is perfectly placed on d1 and of course your knight on e5 is perfectly situated to protect the c4 pawn. But sometimes black plays a move like f6 to kick that knight away from e5 and then go after the c4 pawn. So it's, they're generally speaking, having hanging pawns is very double-edged in nature. But if you had to pick a side, who would you pick right here? Um, I'm, I'm gonna go black. And the reason oh. why is because I would play g5 and f6 and then play knight a5. Those are my next three moves. Wow, okay, g5, f6, and knight a5. So g5, the question is where does your bishop go? Like, if you go to d2, you might just lose d4 on the spot, so that is not ideal. If you go to e3, I block my e file, which I want to keep open for when you play f6, so exactly. that I'm putting pressure. So, what if I go all the way back? Okay, now he started with f6. Okay. So this is different move order, but same concept. So we, the knight should go back just to the most natural square f3, or is there any argument for a foray into g4? Yeah, the knight g4 idea is super interesting, but I guess black is going g5 anyway. Which so knight g4, your idea is at some point perhaps to go to h6. But if I'm going g5, I'm already making sure you can't go to h6, and then I can even play h5 after that if I'm being extra ambitious and kick your knight back to e3. So black is sort of making his king side very vulnerable, but gaining space in the process. So knight f3 is played in rook e8, and this is what I was talking about. Okay, g5 didn't happen yet, but e6 is a target, but c4 is not feeling comfortable. What about the kind of anti-positional move here, c5? just to try to get up my queen onto b3 real quick, maybe even ram through a d5 move. I mean, this is all about the tactics in the position. If I were able to play like c5, you can't take because of queen b7, but okay, Christian actually tried d5. So he's worried that if things just kind of like hang around, he's actually gonna be worse. So yeah, he's but- Hang around, so he's trying to do something. I mean, e5 is my immediate response, then I go bishop f8, then I control all of the dark squares, and it's not a good position for white. I mean, it's just not yeah, comfortable. Yeah, yeah, I'm not a big fan of it either. I see what you're saying. This move E5 and the C5 and squares are just so owned by, by black. Yeah, and actually- I own those dark squares. Like ideally for black, you play bishop C5, trade off the bishops, put your rook on C5 and knight on D6, and just clamp down all the dark squares. The knight is an excellent blockader on the D6 square, and then the C4 pawn is really feeling the pressure. 
Yeah, White's going to have to try to come up with some counterplay. I do see some ideas, maybe some tickles with h4 and h5, maybe rerouting my knight to e4 and getting f4 in. But certainly, I, I, I now prefer black. And your choice when I put you on the spot turned out to be pretty prescient. Yeah, and the reason why is that I just I know from experience as well, playing with the hanging pawns is not easy. And the moment you push one of them, the other pawn is in trouble, right? Because by pushing the pawn d5, it means that your pawn c4 can never really be pushed as black controls that square. Similarly, if you play, you know, if instead of playing for d5, he played for c5, then your d4 pawn is a backwards pawn that's a clear target. So it's just not easy when you're always feeling like they're going to be under pressure, so you move one of them, and then this, the other pawn that you, is still in its original place now is the one that's going to be a, under attack. Really instructive segment. Um, I'm, we're lucky that we pop by this game. Sometimes, Robert, we go for the more wild tactics, but this was fortunate because I think everybody could learn something, including myself, as we'll head over to um, Jeffrey Zhang's game against Steven Zirk, I think, because the game, the match, the second match now between the mechanics and the destiny is now starting to get pretty heated. Even, and even if it wasn't heated, there's a pawn on B2. It's always a good reason to look at a game. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have to sell you too hard on that one. No, I mean, I, you said the game. I clicked on it. And then, you know, you were talking about the match, which, of course, is, you know, very important. And then I looked, and I'm like, wait, there's a pawn over there on B2. And White's not even up a piece for that pawn being on B2. So I'm scared for White's position, honestly. Right, but okay, it's my move. I'm white, and I'm looking to play knight e5. I'm threatening rook d7. So knight e5 threatens rook d7. Maybe I'll go bishop d6 since I know what you're trying to do to me. So. Right, and I was just. Do I have queen g? Does queen g4 jack do anything? Yeah, that's a good question, right? Queen g4, I may just run with my king away to. Uh, yeah, it eight. seems like that's okay. Do I have a better move than, than knight e5? Like, what's Jeffrey's plan here? I wish I could tell you because he's just, to me, when I see this position, I'm like, he's down two pawns. One of them is one square away from promotion, which can possibly mean that even if I lose a piece along the way and I can just threaten to promote, you might just be in trouble regardless. It's just... Yeah, it looks, it looks pretty bad. He's played bishop to e4. Okay, so what if I go c3 now? Are my pawns just full steam ahead? Yeah, trouble. <laughs> trouble here for Jeffrey Zhang as Steven Zirk. I mean, Grandmaster versus Grandmaster, but Jeffrey is certainly a um, huge star. Yeah. And and sorry. One Je of the top Grandmasters in America, right? I was going to say, actually, that was someone I wish was playing in that champion showdown with Jeffrey Zhang. It would have been really cool to be able to see him take on another youngster. Um, I was thinking maybe like Dubov, who is the world rapid champion. So that would have been a huge struggle for him, but that's kind of what he needs at this point in his chess career where he's in that 2660 range. Playing a stronger opponent would be excellent for him and to help him grow as a player. That's so funny because people asked me for the match that I really wanted to see, and you know what I said? What did you say? I think, well, I said Ho Yifan versus Jeffrey Zhang because obviously I wanted a woman in there. Yeah. And then I was like, I want Jeffrey. That actually would have been an excellent match as well, for sure, because they're they're actually quite similar in rating. But Oyufen unfortunately is a little out of practice, so she of course is still a great player. But I feel like that would give Jeffrey the edge in that format. But you give her, you know, she knows she's going to play. Give her a little bit of time. That would be an excellent matchup between two very, very, very strong players. Yeah. So we we think a little bit alike at least. Yeah. But <laughs> Queenie four check is by getting anything here. Um, am I allowed to say no? Like, can I, <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think. Like, I can go queen c6 here and just offer a queen trade. I don't think you're really making progress after that move because you get rook d7 check, which is, you know, it looks nice because it's a pin on my queen, but then when black even goes king to b6 and follows up with bishop to c5, if you give me a check, it's not looking very fun to have the white pieces here. Well, let's take a look at the rest of the games in this match because we've got like seven minutes combined. And oh my gosh, the game between Naroditsky and Wheeler also looks completely insane. Whoa, that king is on a run. What? So what's the material count? Black is up a rook and a knight. Yes, but do you really count the rook on a8 and knight on b8 as being up a rook and a knight? That's a very fair question. <laughs> uh, no. And after queen takes e8, I'm not really sure how the black 
king is expecting to find safety either. There's queen e8. You can't move the knight on b8 without losing your rook on 8, as you pointed out. And knight f7 check is a pretty annoying threat. This looks pretty bad wow. for a wheeler. I wish we'd seen this full this game play out because white must have done some pretty spectacular things to get in this position. I'm just playing back just a few moves. Yeah, I'm pulling up but this game here. Like, just, I'm going backwards, just scrolling through it really quickly because <laughs> I want to know how we got here. 25. Okay, like, let's check it out. It was an absolute Whoa. tactical slugfest. Whoa, knight e4, knight h6, bishop takes f6. Okay, Naradiski is just, you know how you were saying Shanklin was uh, very complimentary of Naradiski? That is such a cool move because the point is if you take on g3, you take this queen, white with bishop e7 check, and your king is stuck. If you take on e7 with the rook, you're protecting the queen on f7, but rook d8 check forces rook to e8, and then rook takes f7 would have been checkmate. That is, that is an insane tactic. And if this isn't game of the week, I don't know what is. Because then he followed up with rook takes f6, and he just crashed through here. Oh, my gosh. Incredible. Bishop takes f6, rook takes f6. Look at those tactics. If we go back to the game, Cameron Wheeler finally came up with knight to a6. So he's willing to give up the rook on a8. But unfortunately... He's going to be down material, and White's still going to have the attack. Yeah, and it's one of those moments where I'm not even sure if you should take it or play knight of seven check and just hunt the king down. But you're right. It's, it's just, you know, even by material, it's a knight for two pawns. So you're not even really ahead as black in the material count, but your king is on d6, and this looks really, really tough. It's probably just lost, I mean, frankly. Yeah, a brilliant game by Daniel Naroditsky. What a huge win for the mechanics, and what a... A stunning series of tactical moves, Robert. Wow. <sighs> and the other games in this match, we've got um, Bot versus Nguyen. And that looks like big advantage for Bot. Jeffrey Zhang now still battling against Zerk, but again, you, as you pointed out, he's down so many pawns. Finally, one other game, Conrad Hall. Will he save some, sta save some points? for the destiny versus the mechanics. I think so. Yeah, he's up, so. a, up a pawn and about to launch an attack and has a bishop, which in this case is great as that bishop controls a very important diagonal that will scare the black king. Yeah, this looks, this looks very nice for Conrad for sure. In fact, it's probably beyond hope already for Andrew Hong. All right, and Jeffrey just did lose. So nice win there by Steven Zerk. Upset Grandmaster versus Grandmaster action, but still an upset victory because, as we pointed out, Jeffrey, very strong Grandmaster. Yeah, and he had the white pieces, so you'd expect him to be playing for the win, not losing that game. So definitely congrats in order for Z-Kid, uh, Steven Zerk. Yep. And Ooh, what, the... did, we, did we get the re resignation yet in the Naroditsky game? Just because it's such an epic game. No, Naroditsky's actually still thinking after the knight a6 move. So, again, he's trying to consider whether he should just take the material, which he did. And, yeah, this is just totally crushing as well because you can't even take the knight on h6 and live. No, queen d8 would you know, we... be a funny mate to see happen. Yeah, just... You know, it's actually instructive, Jen, why he was thinking for so long, because I think you have to make sure 100% your knight h3 check doesn't allow black to make some kind of perpetual. Because by playing knight h3, my only legal king move is king h1, but then knight f2 check, and we repeat. And if I take, then there's queen d4 check, and my king looks exposed, but I could probably wiggle my way out. But it's something you really, really have to calculate to its full end before you decide to take that rook on a8. So just a, a moment that you really have to, you know, verify that all the lines still favor you. And uh, here after knight d3, still ideas with queen d4 check. So black is trying to queen f2 check as well. So black's trying to be tactical here. How does white finish him off? Maybe it's not as easy as it initially looked. Knight f5 check, more tactics. Well, for Naradisky, it'll be easy. Yeah. Again, taking advantage of that sweet little motif you noticed where queen takes f5. Queen d8. Um, there's queen d8, but now there's queen d7, but then we have... He takes it and plays queen... rook d1, I think. Yeah, that's got to be the easiest. I was wondering if something like queen f6 also worked, but no. 
Uh, Queen of Six probably is also really good, but I stopped calculating as soon as I saw a way yeah. to just liquidate, right? Just take, take, sure. with D1, and I'm like, I'm winning this endgame. I know that. No more stress on this poor heart of mine. Oh, I love it. <laughs> you, got, you got all the uh, the musical references. I was watching the stream with Botez. I'll have to get one of those in. Uh, you know, I, I know you know your pop culture, so, uh, you know, you can get... I get, you can hang with me on the pop culture. You're probably even better than I am. So, uh, you know, just feel I free. I do listen to a lot of really cheesy music, but lately I'm also listening to, like, the wheels and the bus go round and round and Elmo song. Yep. So <laughs> for the other moms and toddlers out there, I got some good lyrics for you. Do you listen to the little Einsteins? Go round and round and up and down. Do you listen to the little that- I- Einsteins? No. Okay, because that my cousins who are significantly younger than I am, mm-hmm. they would always be watching that, and so that theme song was just seared in my head for a while, and uh, yeah, they're like flying on their little rocket ship, flying high above little Einstein's. Yeah. I'll get there. I'll get yeah. there. <laughs> All right, Nerdisky no. wins <laughs> his game. This is funny. Uh, so. Oh my God! It looks like there might have been a turnaround in the game between Conrad Holt and Andrew Hong. What happened? What? I mean, Last time we were there, it looked like white was up a healthy pawn. But now look at that king on f4, and the knight and the rook are so beautifully positioned. I think Andrew's doing okay. Yeah, that knight is great. And actually, I would think about even not taking that pawn yet and playing h5, h4, h3. Just run that h pawn down the board because the rook is stuck to the second rank for white. Otherwise, rook d2 check happens. So he went rook d3. He's going to take that pawn with the rook, it seems. Ooh, so bishop e6. Oh no, this is going to be bad news for the destiny then, as I almost called you Yaz, Robert. That's okay. That, you know, to me, that's a compliment. <laughs> I was in St. Louis just a few days ago. Oh, I had to stop myself. But if you make a really good positional insight or tell a very long Korshnoi story, then I'm definitely going to have to call you Yaz. <laughs> if I get Korshnoi story or uh, Tilburg or you know, Mar del Plata, you know, I, I, I know all the Yaz stories. <laughs> He's got some goodies. He does, that's for sure. Actually, I really like that segment story time with Yasser. That was a lot of fun. But let's take a look at this. Is Black actually going to win this game now? I mean, it's a bullet game, so anything can happen. But something must have gone really wrong for Conrad Hall in time pressure because we thought he was cruising. Yeah, but now it's all Andrew Hong cruising because, you know, knight on e5 is perfectly placed protecting c6. Um, just, you know, it's centralized. It's protecting. It's sort of attacking. And here b4, so rook d3, okay, all this makes sense. Rook f6 is the move I would play just to get active, but he's sort of refusing. He's, he's being, being too scared. I don't know if that's the right word, but I don't like how he's playing this. Um, you know, he's not jumping into the position attacking pawns. Instead, he's just kind of, okay, well, this now is king d7, so rook h5, you take a3, I take h6, and now we make a draw. Yeah, so now it's going to be drawn, right? So maybe I'm wrong, and I was being overly critical for no reason, but uh, he has managed to hold this. Rook h6 check. I thought black was going to win there. I thought black had some winning chances. Definitely with that trade of minor pieces, white has escaped. And uh, let's move on, because there's another game that's approaching time pressure. I mean, there's another um, match that's approaching time pressure. Okay. As we see the surfers and the hackers All right. approach time pressure. But not many of the games are... That crazy. Well, I see Soggy Cheese 12. That's uh, Vinesh Ravuri has 12, uh, excuse me, has 35 seconds left. And that he's playing El-Sham. against Elshan Maradi Badi, who has a menacing control over the dark squares. Yeah. I mean, the problem with this match is that it seems like most of the games, even though there's a lot, there's, there, we're starting to get into time pressure territory, it kind of seems like most of the games are more liquidated, or in this case, Elshan just has a huge edge. Yeah, yeah, this is, um, this is one of those sad positions for white where your bishop on g2 is just running into your pawn on d5, your knight on h3 can't move, black has control over the b file, knight a8 to b6 in the near future is not going to be fun to... To see happen, okay, well, c4 is just hanging right away, so that knight maneuver is not even necessary. Yeah, we can go to a different game for sure, because Elshan is cruising. Meanwhile, Azoria, I'm not sure if we looked at this game between um, John Daniel Bryan and Ziad Azoria, but looks like even material, this one likely to be a draw. 
Uh, we checking back in on Carilla versus Pachion. Okay, let's check that one out. Ooh. Similar, similar situation, even material here, work behind the path pawn. Yeah, so both sides have an advanced pass pawn on a rook file, but just be careful if you're black, because let's make a random like rook to a5, then all of a sudden a7 happens and you're losing, because now my rook will hit your king with check, and then I'll be able to promote. So that's the one thing you have to really watch out for, is not allowing your king to have this happen. So you can run your king, say, to g6 and to g7, if you want to avoid that, or you can probably go h3, h2, and just push your pawn down the board and say that, okay, in order to um, stop my pawn, your rook has to go over to the h file, then I'll win your a7 pawn from my h pawn, and we can just shake hands. Yeah, that seems easy. But big news, big news. That game between Craig Hilby and Mamidarov doesn't seem as clear as it used to. What? Let's Remember go. Remember how Mamidarov just won a pawn yep. for nothing? Whoa. But now Craig's got an exchange for... What is it? Two, one pawn. One pawn. Isn't white just better now? How did this happen? Yes, white is better. We've got an exchange for. You, you've got an exchange in a pawn, Maridara, but th those pawns aren't very healthy, right? They're not very mobile. The b6, c7, d6 um, trio. Yeah. They're actually seeming to be held back just by the pawn on d5. Yeah, that's very true. And this kind of attack that's going on here on the king side. Doesn't really feel like that large of an attack. Although now that you put on g4, I'm thinking, how do I get queen f6? That wins the h4 pawn, it looks like. Or if you play after queen f6, you play h5. Then I'm going f3. And now you're starting to feel my attack come in full force here with queen f4 threats, queen h4 threats. It's starting to get a little dicey. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of g4. If I could have avoided that move, I would have loved to with something like king g2. I'm not sure if it was possible, but if I could avoid g4, I'd be very invested in that. That's the thing about rapid, though. I'm sure Craig would feel the same way, but in rapid, you just kind of have to go with your gut. You don't yeah. have time to, like, puzzle out whether it's worth it to weaken your position like that. Right. And especially against someone like Mama Jarov, who is so fast. I've actually played him many years ago at the... Uh, Aeroflot Blitz tournament, and it was amazing how weak he made me feel. Like, just by playing really quickly, and I knew I was better in, a, in one of the games, and I just, his, you know, how quickly and how well I felt like he was playing was just really intimidating, honestly. Yeah, well, that's what they do, the great Blitz players, right? It's like partly, obviously, a lot of it is how skillful they are, but it's also just highly intimidating to play against somebody who plays really, really good moves really, really fast. Because you trust them. That's your biggest mistake is trusting your opponent. Seriously. Like, you have to trust yourself above all else, but you see them make a quick move, you're like, no, they couldn't have blundered that pawn, or like, they wouldn't give me the pawn unless it was good for them. But no, maybe you should take that pawn, and it, it's still in imbalanced position and interesting, but, um, you know, that's something that you can't just give them credit for just because of their name. The pedigree should never come first. And knight d3. Right. Oof. Knight d3 piling up on the f2 square. Yikes, I'm starting to get nervous that things have turned back around for Craig, but does he have a consolidating move here? Um, Just rook rookie f1? Two? Yeah, rookie 2 or rook f1. I mean, I want to cover my back rank, so that's why I wanted to go rook f1, but rookie 2... It's more aggressive. That's yeah. the thing. We're, we're weighing the aggression versus the back rank protection. What's more important here? Oh, if rookie 2, queen b1 check, or queen c1 check, king h2... Um, then, Where's the beef? Then knight e5 comes because my queen protects the f4 pawn. And... Oh, so you're choosing the c1. Okay. Yeah. So then, yeah. I mean, it's not I've clearly like white can go queen e4 and play on, but right. it's a hard thing to decide here because if you play rook f1 gen, you're right. It's very passive. Then maybe black tries for b5, b4, b3, b2, and we saw an f pawn run from f4 to f7 and then eventually f8. This b pawn can start moving its wheels. Yeah, rook, rook f1, though, I see what you're saying, because then after b5, I'm, I'm going to play g5. Ooh, but he's played rook e2, so he chose my first instinct. Yeah. Let's see if he gets punished for that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's... So queen c1 played. So is, Now, king h2 kind of forced, because king g2 would have let, allowed knight e1 check, regaining the exchange. Right. And now knight e5, I would play. Or you could also play knight e1, but no, I don't think you want to block your own queen's path. Yeah, then the queen comes to e4, and now e7, queen e7 check is the, the quick counterattack. Yeah, so knight e5 attacks and defends by clogging that line. Now, were you thinking f3 here? 
So f3, I definitely was thinking about that, but then rook c2 comes and you win c7, and that's going to be painful. So exactly. Like, okay, so f3 is no bueno. We needed to come up with something better than that for Shakriar. Maybe queen d1? Huh, just kind of holding on to your key point there and menacing the idea of f3 later. Yeah, and you know, by putting queen d1, I protect the bishop, I attack the rook on e2, uh, queen d1 just played, and now if white plays rook c2, then black can play this knight f3 check, and your king has to go to g2, in which case knight e1 check shows up on the board again. So you can't actually... Yeah, good move. So you can't move your rook on e2. Oof, juicy. G5. So g5 played. So... Well, what a treat we're in for here, watching this game at the critical moment. Wow, and bishop e3 cuts off the queen's protection of the rook on e2. That might be a move worth considering. Ooh, well, it is... Oh, it's, it's black's move. Yeah. Uh -oh. So bishop e3, then does white just play rook takes e3? Um, I mean, it's, oh, there it is. There it is. Hey, Shakriar is listening to me. This is awesome. I was complimenting him, that's why. You know, now that I gave him exactly. the, all, all the compliments in the world, he's like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll listen to that Hess character. What do we do? Rook c2? I, I don't rook like Rook c2 it. again allows, well, knight like, three check. knight f3 check. Yeah. yeah. The knight f3 check is still there, and that's just dead. Yeah, because rook c2, knight f3, uh, we took on e3. He felt compelled to take on e3, that's right. Queen f5. I playing queen f5, looking for a perp. None, none happening. Queen f3 is a very nice resource here. Because if you take on e3, I'm just happy to trade queens as black, as I have this outside pass pawn, this b pawn, and your g5 pawn is on the dark square, so pretty vulnerable to the, an attack here. So he took, and now we'll see, his mom jar took and winning the g pawn. So, Jen, is this enough, though? That's actually an interesting question because it looks like it should be winning, but it's not that easy with just one knight here and just two pawns for white. Yeah, this one, no, it's not going to be easy. So this one's going to go the distance, I think. We did see the most exciting part of it, but now we're going to see the more of an endgame grind as um, Shaq tries to make it happen. Um, and we did, we did get the... We got the match started between the kangaroos and the Chengdu pandas. Okay, so... Just started. Just started, like, a few minutes ago. Just gotcha. after, Maybe, like, five minutes ago. I, I, I just... I wasn't... I was just rechecking the time that that started because I wasn't sure if we missed a couple games. It looks like... Well... It looks like we only have one game from that match started so far, so the others will probably start shortly. Yep. And Mama Jarov has won this game. Well, he isn't, the game's not over, but he's two pass pawns against a lone bishop. So this was a really exciting game from the very start. Mama Jarv won a pawn, but something went wrong for him. And then it was a topsy-turvy battle, unfortunately, for Craig Hilby. Mama Jarv just proved a little bit too strong. So this is a nice win in the end for the hackers. Yeah, GG. That was, that was crazy. That was really crazy. Oh, there were a lot of crazy games, right? To but the Naroditsky game kind of took the cake, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Naroditsky game was unbelievable, and I don't even think you can put another game as a potential game of the week because it has to go to that game. And I don't want anybody voting for a different game. So just there should not even be a competition. Just tweet that one out. No vote. Just give it to Naroditsky because that was, I mean, that's kind of, maybe his magnus opus, you know, magnum opus. I said magnus opus because magnus is... Well, that's an understandable mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, wait, that's... Even if you hadn't been streaming for the fifth or sixth hour straight, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, when Magnus plays, it's always a Magnus opus. But, okay. Uh, where should we go to now, Jen? Any uh, games catching your eye here? Let's see. I'm just going to... I was just checking in on the standings. But um, I'm, my eye is caught by the fact that Andrew Tang is in time pressure again against Naomi Bashansky, who had such a great game last round where she almost got the Grandmaster Scalp. Can she get it down this time? Whoa, her position looks really good, too. I know. It looks really, maybe even, I mean, dare I say even better than the one that we saw last round against Corrales? I think so, because this is a little bit more clear cut. Like, the other one... Exactly. Yeah, the other one, she was obviously better, and she was pushing, but there were still counterplay chances, in which Fidel used excellently. And here, I'm like, can I just gobble on H3? Like, what are you going to do if I take that pawn off the board? Uh, yeah, you might go after B7, but king safety is paramount here, and... I'm not sure that White King will ever find shelter. 
Yeah, this looks busted for YA. Well, I don't even, like, you're exactly right. Andrew Tang, not only does he not have much time on the clock, but he just looks completely dead. It's like, what's... Uh, the FIO control, the king is open. We're also up a, or we're not up a pod, but it looks like we're up a pod. We're, <laughs> about to, we're, about to, <laughs> we're about to take on H3. I don't know. To me, White's pawns just seem invisible here. Yeah, because, I mean, the move queen H3, if rook takes B7 is probably your main concern. But then I'm throwing my rook back from F3 to F6 and then going rook G6 check or rook to H6. And, I mean, White's king is just in all sorts of danger here. And you just traded pawns, so she went rook takes H3, which probably is Looks still excellent. Empty. Yeah. I mean, now after rook takes b7, what's the knockout, Robert? Is it rook? There's so many tempting moves here. Rook f3, rook f4, rook f6. Yeah, rook h4. Right. I uh, don't know. Rook h5, something, anything. I have no idea. But they all look they very all, good. They all look so good. That's a, that's the tough part here, deciding between them. I, I see your temptation. One of your first instincts was rook h4 because you don't want to move the rook. If we don't have to, if we can keep the rook f8 defending the back rank, then there's less for us to calculate. Right. Like if we look at a move like rook f4, we have to consider queen d5 check. And is there anything, any way for you to take advantage of like, for instance, king h8, queen takes c6, and rook b8 check? Yeah. Are there any kind of weird variations like that that well, could work? You don't even have to play queen c6, you just play rook b8 check immediately. And knight takes b8, and then queen d8 will win that back rank. So yeah, you're absolutely exactly. right. You're absolutely right. And that would be way better because the way I did it would have allowed you some intermezzos that probably actually would have won. So um, I, that's why you, your instinct, I think, was rook h4. But instead, Naomi played queen g5 check. But is this one a good one? Because now yeah. queen g2 seems to potentially just gain a tempo, and, and I'm not sure I love it. Yeah, that was a big mistake. And I really one of the reasons I also liked rook h4 instead of queen, uh, this queen move was rook h4, black and then play e4 and then bring the knight to e5 and bring the knight to f3. Like a very logical sequence. By trading the queens here, now Tang has this rook on the seventh rank. Uh, we are even in terms of material, but I mean, White's worst days are definitely behind him. And I could see Naomi losing this game quite quickly, honestly, because um, it's hard mentally, psychologically, to go from what should be a promising attack in just like two moves, trading off to end game where you can't really be any better. Ah, uh, yikes. Another miss for Naomi, but boy, is she getting good positions against Grandmasters, Robert. I mean, that's, I, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to congratulate her on it, but I'm going to say it's indicative of something good. Yeah, no, no, no. She's clearly playing very well, and it's seemingly much better than her 2033 rating that I see here. I mean, that's, she seems to be very underrated, and you're right. Like, you don't want to just keep congratulating people for um, playing good moves and not getting the results because at a certain point you just have to put your opponents away and I've said this to many people when you start getting to that 2200 range your opponents just aren't blundering really anymore so you have to not only just get an advantage but continue to press and squeeze and finally get that full point otherwise you're going to be missing a lot of opportunities to uh, score. So. Oh, I got a, I got some news from Commissioner Greg Shahadi, and I think one of the reasons I was a little bit confused by the uh, Chengdu Panda Kangaroos match was that um, he tells me Australia's board one has not shown up and has forfeited the match. Then so oh Miro did not show up. So pretend, pretend we don't know probably some technical problem of some sort. So unfortunately for the Kangaroos, they're starting up with a big disadvantage. Yeah, but I'm just trying to figure that out because right now the scoreboard seems to indicate the Australian Kangaroos are winning one and a half to half. So um, maybe we'll get some insight there because if they forfeited, then Shangdu probably should have more than half a point. But I'm guessing that's a typo, but gotcha. I'm sure we'll get confirmation of that soon. Sharp eyes. Yeah, you know, I wear glasses, so I don't really have sharp eyes, but the four eyes work together really well to help me see these things. <laughs> All right, let's 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 look let's hunt for those time scrambles, okay. Ooh, so Nikolevsky has eight seconds left, I just saw out of the corner of my eye there. And he's losing to Thomas Beardson. Oh god, upset city here, Robert. Whoa. This guy Beardson is so good. I mean I, I Oh yeah, I saw him I saw him pull off another upset, right? Wasn't that just last round? Yeah, he beat Tigran Petrosian. So <laughs> Yeah, that's right. We we came in at the very end where he was just up a queen. Yeah. 
Which he had been since move 20 or so. Yeah, so right now we see that Mikulevsky, well, trying desperately to hold here, but he's down in exchange, he's down two pawns. So this is going to be an easy win for Thomas Beardson, who has to be in, like, all-star conversation for the Pro Chess League because every week I feel like the guy's doing work. I'm actually going to check to see exactly how well he's doing because I feel like it's, he must be performing way above his rating. He is performing at 2,600 for the year, and that's before wow. this week. And today he's performing at like 2,900 because <laughs> he's just beating, two gra beating up on two grandmasters. And it's funny, it's like not even when we come to his games, it's just like, oh, he's just winning against another grandmaster. He's up a queen. He's up a rough. Yeah. <laughs> nice life. Yeah, that guy can play chess a little bit, it seems like. Um, so, okay, that game is finished. Where do we go to next? And by the way, your typo was, um, of course, faithfully rendered by the... Uh, by the team at chess.com and it has switched from one and a half to the pandas and half a point for the kangaroos and sad start for the kangaroos of course is i think somebody might have mentioned a flight delay or something that that caused it hopefully he'll get in time for the rest of the matches yeah i hope so you know never like to see forfeits last week we saw in the battle royale the moscow phoenix just didn't show up on the right day and so they forfeited their all their matchups, and yeah, it's unfortunate. And what's also unfortunate, Jen, is I pulled up this Naomi Bashkansky game, and well, she's in a tough spot in this end game here. She's down one pawn, about to be down a second, and uh, not good news for her or for the sluggers. Yikes, yeah. That's unfortunate as Andrew Tang does what he does best. Although she's, she's, she's still fighting. It. She's fighting here. She's got that H pawn, so the king might run to. King F2, King G1, have run to H1, but so H3, okay, she's fighting well still. King G1, H2, check. okay, so DG threw in a check first. But how much of a difference are these checks going to make? At some point, you're going to run that king over there. Now, Rook D8, okay. Oh, Rook D8, just Rook F, uh, to D5. So your Rook's getting cut off regardless. Well, now Rook E7 check picks up the H7 Rook. And then you pick up H2. So, okay, Naomi is lost now. It's official. Sorry to all the Slugger fans out there. She's, she's struggling to put her opponents away once she is uh, getting into great positions against these GMs. But I predict good things for her in the future as let's take a look at um, Zhu Zhang Yu's game against Raymond Song. Okay. Oh, well, actually, as soon as I said that, it's like the Queens got traded and it became a little bit less interesting. But... It should be noted that this game, this match is now underway, and that's the last match we have of the of the day that started. So, yep. And I'm going to pull the standings up real quick just to show everybody this is the Pacific Division, and just to know who was winning this or leading the division, I should say, before this week. It was the Dallas Destiny ahead of the Shangdu Pandas up there, with the Minnesota Blizzard in third, and with a fighters, you know, fighting chance to compete for first place here. So, very interesting division we're covering right now. Oh yeah, this is this is good stuff. Yeah. I don't know if I've seen the Jinshi game versus Ealingworth game start yet. They drew very quickly. Oh, that's why. Okay, I was totally confused. Yeah, Got it. I was now as I'm... well, and then I like saw it half half somewhere. I was like, oh wait, they drew in fifteen moves. Got it, got it. I see it now. Kaka six 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 first in Ilinworth. Yeah. Good eye again, man. <laughs> Those glasses. Yeah, they're they're really coming handy. I don't know if you ever heard of them. They're you know, they're just Prescription glasses, doctors recommend them, people often fight them, but they really help me, so I'm happy to have them. I've been wearing glasses for so long, they're just you know, second nature to me at this point. Uh, well, let's, you know what's interesting today is the, the game between Vinay and Jeffrey Zhang. Has Jeffrey come off a disappointing loss? Will he be able to bounce back? And this is one of his favorite openings, the Grunfeld defense. Woo. Okay. Pretty Pretty thrilling position here. Yeah, when I think of the Grunfeld, typically I don't quite think of this position, but I do play this line as white. So when I see it, I'm like, okay, I know exactly where this came from. And it's sort of like a, in some ways, like an anti Grunfeld, because you develop this bishop very early for white. And the point is, like, instead of getting these st structurally better but end game type positions, you get keeping the queens on and making it a very interesting, more tactical battle. And um, I tend to think that 
well, I tend to just prefer playing on the white side of these positions, but black gets very rapid development and a quick initiative, so it's not like white just has a free play in these sort of dynamics. And uh, yeah, here it's, um, you know, the bishop on h6 looks awkward, the bishop on e6 doesn't exactly look like the best spot either, but the b file is open, black can make use of that quite quickly, and I think that Vinay Bot should be happy considering his four, nearly four minute time advantage as well. I'm taking a quick look at the uh, at the Twitch chat, and of course, people are accusing us of cursing Naomi with a commentator curse, hot diggity dog. That every time we come to her game, she's crushing, and then she ends up losing as soon as we start watching. They're not wrong. That is what's happened. <laughs> but it's also not our fault. Um, it's like blaming the dealer in poker, right? Well, it's always the dealer's fault. <laughs> no, of course. You know, I, I just that's true. I just want to take the blame here. I, just, I know people are going to say the commentator's curse. It's my bad. I've been doing this all day, cursing people, jinxing them. So, you know, it happens. Bad luck to them. Well, you've been cursing people and you've been blessing people. Yeah. So at least there's that. You know, I, I, I try to be an equal opportunist. But I, after Queen A6, what is black going to do? So what's wrong with just castling? So you have to be always... Oh, considering what happens after castling, then do I lose my c4 pawn? And if I do lose my c4 pawn, is it really that big of a deal? Because once more, black will take on c4, they'll take on d4 and play quick rook c8, and you can see the very rapid development that black is getting, but is it worth the pawn that you're, you might be losing in the process? So Jeffrey took on d4 first, but now the knight can take on d4, and that looks promising to me for white. Typically, you don't want to yeah. leave yourself with an isolated pawn, but that knight on that square is really strong. Knight takes d4 indeed. Quick bishop d5 by Jeffrey. Of course, he does not want to lose that bishop. Yeah, now... That was not part of the plan. Because mm -hmm. now bishop c4, well, we, you have to consider the ramifications of bishop takes g2. That just looks so wild. Right, bishop c4. Knight c6 is coming in if we ever remove our bishop from that diagonal. Yep. Uh, gosh. And even in the starting position, like, there's just so many tags. Knight f5 is a possibility here, because knight f5, if you try to protect e7 by playing bishop f8, knight d6 check will win your queen, since you have to take with the pawn, and your queen will be lost uh, once that pawn moves. And after knight f5, well, what else do you do? Because now e7 is under attack, and your bishop on h6 is under attack, and if you take on f5, I take your bishop on h6 with my queen. So that actually might be a favorable little swap, a very interesting way to trade off pieces, but it looks... Very tempting for, for white here. Knight f5, nice move, taking advantage of the loose bishop on h6. I mean, it's just, just weird dynamics at play, because your move knight c6 also is very tempting for me here, saying, well, if you don't take me on c6, then I'm going to take on e7, and I'm going to win a pawn. I don't know. Maybe, and you can also probably just play bishop c4, as you pointed out as well. I mean, just, a lot of these moves look good for white. It's just putting all the pieces together. But so far, just looking at the standings, like potential blowouts underway here, Robert, as San Francisco mechanics, life just keeps getting better. Even this match, it looks the position looks kind of sweet for White on both the clock and on the board, while Jeffrey is supposed to be the favorite. So it could be a tough day for the mechanic, I mean, for the destiny, and a very good day for the mechanics. Meanwhile, the blizzard is also just dominating, right? And with the, the surfers in the San Jose, obvious, that seems like the closest match that we might have on tap so far. Obviously, kind of too early to say with the pandas versus the kangaroos, but let's just hope Miro shows up. Yeah, let's hope they don't forfeit all their games. I was gonna give a shout out to the over 7,000 people that are watching us now. Um, just to remind everybody what this is and who we are, this is the Pro Chess League. It's week eight of the regular season. I'm Grandmaster Robert Hess with the one and only WGM Jen Shahadi, renowned commentator extraordinaire, and a very, very good poker player as well. So, um, you know, you just everyone should know how talented you are, Jen. A writer, uh, you know, very prolific author and speaker. I mean, I don't know how much more do I got to rep you here. I feel like I could be your personal hype man. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> of course, Robert's the best. So we're having so much fun here watching these games. Um, so many top players um, involved in this league. Right now, we're looking at one of our very top players, Robert, though, Jeffrey Zhang, potentially in trouble as he's got less time on the clock 
and we're not that crazy about his position either. Yeah, now the c4 pawn can be captured with the queen as well. Rook to d1 is tempting because I'm saying this knight on b5 is pinned one way, but as soon as you castle, it's no longer going to be a pin. So let me go rook d1 and get ready to remove my knight from d4 and make use of this pin on the d file. It's looking very tough for Jeffrey here. And one of the things that the pro chess league is, uh, makes it so awesome is that players like Vinay Bhatt who a lot of chess players won't know about, but Jen, you and I, of course, know about him as a United States player who has been around in the upper echelons of American chess for a long time, but doesn't play over the board much anymore. It gives him a chance to show off that, hey, I can hang with the best of them, including the 18-year-old Jeffrey Zhang in this rapid format. Absolutely, and that's what's so great about online gaming, Robert. Everybody can get into the action, and... That's what one of the things I love so much about chess. Uh, another game that which I'm kind of interested in, it's a really interesting looking end game between the Chengdu Pandas and the Kangaroos with uh, the super talented um, Bao um, currently seeming to be in a lot of trouble versus Smirnov, unfortunately, because look at that knight on E2. <laughs> um, and that just that opposition, the king on E1. It seems like White's almost in Zuxma. Yeah, that's not a good bishop. And it's just funny because if you ever took that knight on e2, okay, and resignation has just occurred. But I was going to say, if you, instead of playing f4, if you took that knight on e2 instead, which looks way more normal, well, you're just entering a losing uh, king and pawn endgame because your king is stuck protecting f3. You can't move your king, you lose that pawn. If you push f4, then you simply take that pawn and your king is running out of squares very quickly. King g1, pawn f3, I win the f2 pawn, and then I'm just going to promote very quickly and get a queen. So not good news for the Shangdu Pandas, but very good news for the Kangaroos, who forfeited their board one game against the board four for the Pandas. That's never a good thing. So um, we'll see. So if, they needed that. Yeah, we'll see they if really he shows up. That. They really, really did it for sure. And we actually have only one more game going on in that match between the game between Song and Zhu Zhang Yu, which I dismissed earlier because I said it was like not that interesting. But it's getting a little bit more interesting as uh, this clever move G5 was just played, trying to um, collapse white center and win two pawns for the price of one. Yep. And that was a really good move. Black looks better now. Absolutely. And the reason why knight c4 was just played, because if you play king e4, you look like you're winning this pawn back, but then f3 is played. And the point is, now I'm either going to promote, or you're going to capture my pawn, but if knight takes e5, winning your knight on d6. So this situation here with knight c4 is certainly not ideal for white. And if I'm Xu uh, Shang Yu, a4, nice move, so you can play b5 without giving up a pawn there. That's really nice. A technical play by him and the main issue is this pawn on g5 an outside pass pawn which can be annoying in the ensuing end game but jen we gotta like black's chances here up a pawn in this knight and pawn endgame with threats of b4 and a3 of his own that's right but look at the clocks wherever it is Ooh, this move knight b7 check is now gonna re cause Ooh. us to release our protection of the knight on e5 and i don't like that at all wait what's happening here king e5 and then isn't that g-pawn rolling? So take, you take the knight on b7, g5. Yeah, but we're going to queen at the same time, right? g5, b4, g6, a3. Yeah. And we get to queen with check to boot. Yeah, so, so he's going to king d4, I think. And then black's play e5 check. Very important move. To kick the king farther away, e5 check comes in now. E5, nice move, good technical move. Otherwise, the king would be in that square yeah. in order to stop the pawn. But now we can just push our other pawn forward with E4. Oh, no, that was a blunder. No, they both just blundered, I think. Why? Because after E4, he could have played king takes B4, and his king is in time to cut oh, off this God. pawn. Oh, God. E3, king C3, and we're still in the square. We're in the square. So what we should have done A3 first and then E3. Exactly. So mutual oh. blunders here. And now it's been saved once again because after it takes your king B3, now my E pawn is queening right after your G pawn queen. So that was a tremendous oversight by both players and why you need to study your pawn in games and know your squares. And don't pre-move. <laughs> Because in, unless you're down to like a few seconds, Robert, sometimes this pre-moving can really um, cause you to, to trip up. 
Yep. That is. I wonder. It, that looks like a potential preview move situation where they're just like push, push, push without, you know, stopping to think and make sure you're making the right move. He, he did have 40 seconds after all. Yeah, very, very strange because I always say when I'm in a moment where I see a critical decision, and I understand he didn't have that much time left, but even if I have, let's say, 40 seconds, I'm spending maybe half my time just to analyze because I know that I can reach this end game that we've gotten right now. Like that, that I've already figured out. So you always have to be aware that the dynamic may have changed, the plans may need to change accordingly, and that there might be a tactic in the air. So just take a little bit of time, because if I know that this is the end result and I'm going to make a draw this way, let me just see if I have a win on hand, and that move King takes before would have been winning. Just a crazy, crazy how much you learn about end games from freaking Blitz Chat. Yeah. It, it's really amazing. You think like Blitz Chat, this is throwaway, but you could just sit down and analyze all these games and learn so much. Uh, let's check back in in Vinay Bot versus Jeffrey Chong. Although I do want to give a shout out to the person who um, requested the Blizzard. We will try to get to some Blizzard games as well. Yeah, they're but, well ahead in their matchup, six and a half, one and a half. But yes, we of course would like to give them their due. But they have more time on their clock, so I can't kind of help but uh, look at this, be mesmerized by this, uh, by this game between Jeffrey and Bot right now. Yep. And I want to um, answer a question in the chat. Someone said, what's the timer at the bottom? It's Shank Wolf. And the timer that you see under next to Vinay Bot's name and next to Jeffrey Zhang's name, that's how much time they have left in their game. These are clocked games, so they don't have all the time in the world. They start with 15 minutes in every single game with two seconds increment, two seconds additive with every move they make. So I just wanted to clarify that for um, the audience. That's awesome. Yeah, it sounds like we've got some gamers from other worlds popping into the stream. I, I think I, I saw somebody say that they came to play Apex Legends and now they're watching chess. Welcome, welcome. We hope that you stay and get into this game that's been around in its current form for just uh, six centuries. Yeah, you know. So, it's been around the block a few times. You could say it's it's uh, stood the test of time, Robert. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think that's uh, the best way to sum it up for sure. <laughs> but uh, Jeffrey Zhang versus Vinay Bot, I, I, I kind of can't keep my eyes off this game because it's so wild as we're starting to approach time pressure with both players having only a little over three minutes left in their clocks. Well, you're going to be unhappy with me in a second when I'm going to suggest to move queen a6 to maybe not be so wild anymore. Yeah, I get it. I mean, <laughs> queen, queen a6, why wouldn't you want to trade queens in this position with white? It seems like a logical dis decision considering that... Actually, I don't know. Queen a6, uh, immediate castles by Jeffrey. So his idea is that if queen takes c8, rook on f takes c8, and you might have some trouble with your c3 pawn, but e7 is also hanging. So yeah. I don't really know what's going on. Yeah, that's... Uh... Whoa, so bishop b7. So Jeffrey now wants to keep the queens on. He was saying that if the queens uh, get traded, now I'm down a second pawn. That's going to be miserable for me. So bishop b7 at least leaves that open. So, oh, and the bishop on c4, if you're queen a4 to protect that bishop, then knight b6 comes on the board. So you have to be very careful here not to just get forked and lose some material. True, but what about queen b5? Queen, well, queen b5 and the bishop takes g two or something like that. Like, annoying, yeah. So you're saying queen a4, knight b6. So maybe queen d6, just to say, take my bishop, I'll take your knight. That might be a weird way to trade pieces, but perhaps one that's necessary. Yeah, that could work. Queen, queen d6, huh? Yeah, I, I don't want to get forked. So it's kind of a process of elimination. There it is. Because queen a4 looked not great, queen b5, similar. And now queen d6 is like, okay, that's another move that indirectly, quote-unquote, protects my bishop by attacking an enemy piece. And I think that's a mistake a lot of less experienced players make. They overprotect pieces, and they're always in the lookout, like, oh, no, my piece needs to be protected a second time before I move this other piece. And so, yeah, you, sometimes you can offer a trade by giving up your piece as long as you've attacked another piece in the process. Um, yeah, brilliant, because I was, like, getting a little worried for white, but now I'm loving white. Because uh, if you move your rook, rook away from e8, suddenly my, if you move your rook to e8, for instance, suddenly my bishop on c4 is so strong and I'm keeping it. And you have to worry about bishop takes f7 check, potentially. I don't know if it works quite there, but that's always in the air with you weakening that square. Yep. No, absolutely. Queen e6 check, 
king d7. It seems like you're just hanging on for now, but... But you're definitely opening up the door for some kind of checkmating attack, and uh, maybe I'll just park my bishop on b3, where it's very safe, and then go for the attack. So, okay, Jeffrey takes on c4, so he loses his bishop in return, and, well, white's up two pawns, but black has some counterplay. This bishop on b7 is on a happy long okay. diagonal. Why didn't we take on f8 first? Because knight f8, queen takes b8. Um, that was just winning. Yeah. Knight f8, as you pointed out, queen take... Yeah, wow. See, this is... You know how I said you don't put pedigree first? I just assumed Jeffrey Zhang's an amazing player, so if he, of course he's making the right moves in that moment. And then you're like, wait, but what about just taking that rook first? That was just, I mean, winning. There's just nothing to say about Bishop takes f8, of course, was a great move. And Vinay went queen takes d7 in 1.6 seconds, talking about pre-moving or moving too quickly. Well, Vinay should have spent a little bit of time here to consider Bishop takes f8. Jen, you're 100% right. Yeah, you know, I always tell my students, a lot of times when you mess up in tactics, it's not because you don't see a long enough variation. It's because you don't look wide enough. That's a so it's about breadth, not depth. That's a, that's, sorry, go ahead. I mean, and that's usually where people mess up, right, Robert? Yeah, and that's a really great way of summing it up, honestly, because, um, you know, we talk about this. People always ask, how do I see more ahead? Or how do I get to see five moves down the line to the three moves I currently see? And oftentimes, it's honestly not even as much a visualization problem as an evaluation problem, because you're capable of going down a line, but you're not necessarily capable of juggling four different variations and also coming up with an, an objective evaluation saying, okay, at the end of this series of moves, I have benefited for X, Y, and Z reason and coming to like the right conclusion. So, yeah, I mean, I liked how you said that and it's a very important lesson for everyone watching that um, you know, sometimes the obvious move is not the right one. You should always be second guessing yourself. As chess players, we have to be skeptical in every single move. And as human beings and citizens of our country, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, there's a word I'm not going to say. Absolute blank lutely. Yes. <laughs> For now, sure. Mr. Naraditsky, uh, the beast, who played a, what you consider the game of the week so far, is um, currently up against Conrad Halt for the Destiny. And man, it's been a beautiful day for the mechanics so far. Is Naraditsky going to continue um, increasing the pain here? Well, let's take a look at this wild position. So Material seems equal at the moment, but both kings are bad. Oh, actually, white's up. I thought the same thing, then I realized white's up a pawn. I'm bad at counting the material when it starts. I always do this. I'm like, I do one, two, three, okay, four pawns and five pawns. So actually, white is up a pawn, but the, be oh, you're right. okay. the best piece on the board is this bishop one. And as soon as I say that, the bishop gets taken. I was like, oh, the bishop on h1 is amazing. And there it goes off the board. So what's Conrad's plan here, though? I mean, what if I just go knight f2 and... And it looks like you're kind of covering everything, and you're up now. You're up two pawns. So I'm up. Well, I'm in exchange, and two. Yeah, what? Like this was very weird. Um, he has no time okay. on his clock, so that was part of the issue. So White is just totally winning. I think yeah. so. I'm just trying to find. You know, like I said, being skeptical is important. I'm trying to figure out where White can go wrong or Black can go right. But even the move King G1, actually, that might even be the safest move because Knight of two. There might be bishop e6, trying to go bishop c4 and pin my queen. But if I go king g1 to start with, well, then you have no pins, and I protect my knight, and all is well in the world. Indeed. So that, that we came to that one at a bad time for Conrad Halt. But meanwhile, can Jeffrey Zhang pull off the comeback against that after um, he missed that win, which was a, a real goner? Uh, I think he might be able to. He's got a minute left to 20 seconds for Vinay, and... Maybe Vinay's position is still better, but it's a lot to work out, and those two bishops could get nasty. Yeah, you're, if you are met with a timely queen e4, including right now, you can't go f3 because your e3 pawn will be hanging. After queen e4, knight f3, then there will be an eventual ideas where I move my queen away from the diagonal, and bishop takes f3 becomes a threat. So I definitely agree with you that Jeffrey seems like he's been improving his position, still is worse, but the time situation is also favoring him. Look at Vinay saying, let's get these queens off the board. I'm up two pawns. Please take me. Absolutely not, Jeffrey says. <laughs> and that's something that these strong players um, are so good at, knowing when to trade queens and when to say no. 
And when you've got an attack and you're down two pawns, then there's definitely no room to trade the ladies. Yeah, you're completely right. And actually, it's an important lesson. Sometimes you liquidate knowing, okay, I can win back one of the two pawns I'm down, and I can make a draw. But here, that wasn't in the card. And so he's, look at his bishop on c4. It's a better piece than that knight on d4. Because the knight is perfectly situated, but it can't really move. And that's what Jeffrey's going to have to rely on to try to hold this game here as... h5. He's just going for the attack. And he's, look how quickly he's moving. He's just going to try to flag Vinay Bot. Yeah, when you were on with Alexander Botez earlier, I saw how excited she got when somebody was like about to flag someone. It was like, flag them, baby. Yep. Well, <laughs> yeah, I don't think. I love that energy. I don't think there's going to be a flag in this game. That knight's coming right to f5. Or not. I take it back. Oh, but suddenly, like, things got a little bit better for White, I thought, because you, you, plugged, you plugged down, you locked it down on the h1 to a8 diagonal. Yeah, and rook e3 was a bit of a clumsy move. Rook e4 definitely was better. Swing that rook to g4, where you put pressure on that g5 pawn. He went f4. But now rook a2. Rook a2. Yeah, what was Plex, that? Plex winning. Whoa, f5. What was this? Blunder. Oh. Blunder and time pressure. That's really sad. And Jeffrey manages to outwit Pot. And it's not over, though. Rook well, g4 here. Oh, okay. Oh, not over. All right, it's, oh, it's pretty over. It's pretty over. Now yeah. that it's f6... If f6 was not played, then white would have had some chance by taking on g5. But once f6 comes on the board and this queen just starts eating all the, the c3 pawn and then the knight is bad, yeah, Jeffrey outclassed him in the time scramble. Well, hey, I said Jeffrey didn't want to trade queens, but when it's a queen for a rook, he acquiesced. Yeah, <laughs> that's true, right? You know, he's, he's happy to trade off into a favorable position. So that was a really exciting finish. I see Cam Wheeler has 12 seconds left. And he's also looking like he's in big trouble against Andrew Hong of the Mechanics. So the Mechanics are just, you know, full steam ahead. Biggest super grandmaster of the day, Shakriyar Mamidarov, has an interesting imbalance versus John Bryant uh, as Shakriyar has got the queen for the two rooks, but a little bit of a bonus that he also has that stunning pawn on C7. Yeah, that, and that looks like a, a brutal combination. But that pawn on c7 might be falling down very soon because that bishop on g4 is perfectly located covering the c8 square. And black is one move away from playing rook c8 uh, himself. But that queen c5 move is nice because you're challenging these rooks. And now the rook can't go to c8 because the rook on e7 was hanging. So we'll take... Now bishop b or, or bishop h3, does it work? Uh, rook e2 check, I think, will be the likely response. Ah, uh, yes, that's a nice one. Okay, I can't do that then. I was trying to trade off those bishops and then play queen e7. Whoa, f5. So you have to take with the bishop. Take with the pawn, then I get my queen. So I'm threatening to play c8 equals queen. So bishop takes exactly. f5. Should be the response. And so what does that accomplish for white exactly? Mm, trying to figure that out. Indeed. Bishop takes f5. My bishop h3 still doesn't work, does it? Because you still have rook e2 check. Yeah. So maybe he's going to take on d5. And I think what he did was give himself the f4 square to run his king to. Yeah, yeah, because he sees that possibility of just running the king all the way up to f6. And because I guard the f8 and e6 squares, I'm guarding all the key checking squares. Yep. So you're, my, my king's just going to go for a home run and actually create mating threats against the black king. Wow, so then f5 oh. was a really smart move. What a genius conception. Oh, my God. This is why he's one of the top grandmasters in the whole world. Yeah. Shakriar. Well, Shaq. <laughs> the Shaq attack. Shaq Diesel. Wait, this isn't Shaquille O'Neal, but, you know, we can pretend like he is. That was really, really nice. F5, clearance tactic, right? So normally we think clearance to put a, let's say we move a pawn so our knight gets a square, but here it's so the king can get into the game. Now, bishop c6 cuts off the rook on c2 from attacking the c7 pawn, and there it's played. And now white would love to play d5, move the queen away, and try to get this uh, c pawn home to become another queen. And we got a question from Mick Loping, who's asked if watching chess streams will help with him solving quadratic and differential equations. I'd say yes, because if you start looking at these chess games, it's going to be so difficult. Try to analyze it. Your math homework will seem easy in comparison. And if you watch John Urschel's chess stream, you might actually be able to ask him questions that he will help you with. So that seems like the best possible solution to that question about getting better at these kind of math concepts. 
John Urschel, of course, a former NFL player and PhD candidate at MIT and, well, of course, very close friend of Robert's. <laughs> yeah, we all make mistakes. He, for some reason, he chooses to be, you know, one of my best friends. So things happen. But, you know, very smart when it comes to math. Maybe not so great at picking friends. Let's, let's put it that way. <laughs> and it, it, as for chess, somewhere in between. Like very good, but not the grandmaster level. Exactly. So. He's, he's, he's a work in progress. That's how I, I put it. And anyway, in this game, okay, yeah, I mean, this is just so good for Shaq because he's managed to create this uh, now two uh, connected pass pawns as well as having the stronger king position. So he's going to get this done. Let's see if there's any other games in time heat. Uh, it looks like Azoria is in time pressure against Hildy, okay. but it's an end game where he can probably build up some time on the clock if needed. Yeah, and he's, so, up, he's up a couple pawns, so it's not like he's in any... Uh... He's not in any real danger, so he can go rook c4 check and then try to bring the rook to e4, king to d2, and he should be able to consolidate this one for sure. And oh my god, I gotta tell you, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but Naomi Fashkansky is doing well again. So let's not look at her game. Again. Right? We can't look okay. at her game because we've been told that we're jinxing her and, and you know, we're commentators curse, but I believe you that she's doing well. I just don't want to ruin it for her and for all the fans who are you know, getting on our case about... You know, okay, okay, so this is basically the test of the commentator's curse. Yes. If she ends up winning this game, it will prove that the commentator's curse really is a thing. Exactly. And that she should have, she should have won all three games. Okay. This isn't anecdotal okay. or anything, and we're not talking about correlation and causation. You know, none of this really matters. It's just we're proving it on air right now for 9,531 of you, so... That's right. It's actually like, yeah, this is a big research project, actually. <laughs> yeah, the we, commentator's curse. We have a great amount of people watching. So Zoria wins this game by resignation, which means that the hackers are moving ahead of the surfers, but this match is still very, very close and still plenty of time left for this one to play out. Oh, I'm feeling good about this game in terms of it being exciting for us and the fans. I'm feeling really good about the game between Tigran Petrosian versus Andrew Tang because... It's a completely thrilling position with attacks for both sides. Whoa. And time pressure is looming. I got to say, I like white, because if it's an attack on the king side versus an attack on the queen side, then checkmate beats winning a couple of pawns. Right. But can we just go in right away? Because it does seem like you're doing a decent job of defending the key business squares. I play queen f6, g7, maid is not on the menu. Knight f6, you hide with king h8. So how do I break through? You put your queen and knight on the F6 at the same time and say checkmate. <laughs> That's a good point. And you know, there was a version of chess. I talked about how it's 600 years old, but they were tweaking the rules a little bit, you know, around 1500, 1600. And there was a queen at some point that moved like a queen and a knight. Yeah, that's, I mean, and Yasser has some game too, right? Yasser, a Sarawan chess that has a combination of pieces, I think. Right? Like, yeah, like there's one that moves like a, a rook and a knight. I mean, like a rook and a knight as opposed to a... And then one that moves like a bishop and a knight. But not a queen and a knight. That's just too strong. Yeah, Robert. that's just not fair, right? If you want a queen f6 that moves like a knight, just check me on the board. It's just amazing. But it actually, you know, it sounds like a joke when I say that, but this is actually part of the problem in white's position is that the f6 square is needed by multiple pieces, and you highlighted this very well, Jim, where if you play knight f6 check, then the king hides on h8, and you can't put it in check again because you need to put a piece on f6, but your knight's there. And if you play queen f6, well, you're not actually threatening mate yet because there's a bishop on f8. So instead, he gave up the c2 pawn or lost the c2 pawn. I don't know uh, which it was. But here, can't black continue with moves like knight to c3 and just, like, go after the h? Like, if I take on a2 right away, what's going to happen? That's, that's the first question. I need to come up with a way to continue my attack. I mean, is there some way for me to do... I'm looking at, like, sacrifices, but I can't find a good one. Uh... Rook to c7, instead of playing knight c3 going in for the attack, was Andrew Tang's choice. You know why I don't mm. like that? It, it why? Sh it shows me that he's very worried, which maybe he should be. But if I'm white, I'm going full steam head, bishop f6 to g7. You pointed out very well that I need to uh, get rid of your bishop from that square in order to mate you. So if I go bishop f6, I'm threatening bishop g7, followed by knight f6 checkmate. Right? That's, that's my clear path forward. And I say, what's your move going to be, Jen? And you say, well, I'm going to play knight c3. I'm like, okay, go for my a2 pawn. I'm going to play bishop g7. Go mm -hmm. 
go ahead and take me on g7 because once I take with the h pawn, I have ideas linked to knight f6 check, or if you take on g7 with your king, I have queen f6 check with knight h6 to follow, and your king is just really getting in danger very quickly. Oh gosh, yeah, it looks really beautiful. I have to say this bishop f6, bishop g7 idea. You need a little bit more. The thing about attacking, as you mentioned with rook a2 and knight t3, it's not just about attacking. Sometimes it's also about defense, about playing a move like knight e2. Yeah. So suddenly your queen's going to be kicked out of the party. Yeah. This passivity doesn't only stop our attack, it also hurts your defensive opportunities, which is so, it's like insult to injury, right? Absolutely. And then knight on c3 was also could come to e4. But now it looks like it's going to be a move too late. Because right now, bishop g7 was played. Wait, queen but f7, mate. Queen f7. Oh, mate in one. Queen f7. Nice. Mate in one. Oh, that stinks. Oh, my. That's... Secret Resilion with a great win over Andrew Tang. Does, uh, not only does his name, but does his game also remind you of a certain Tigran Petrosian? You know, just uh, full force, brutal, but also very smooth. Just going for this checkmate. You know, this... Great to see checkmate on the board, especially when we have some new viewers, Robert, because they get to see the final blow that when you're starting out in chess, that's why you love the game, because you get a chance to get checkmate. And notice that the bishop on e7, the reason this was so hard to defend was because there wasn't a lot of good squares for the bishop on e7, and therefore we, were, we had to disconnect our beautiful defense of the f7 square, right? Yep. If we could have played like bishop a3, then it actually wouldn't be that easy Well, you would have had knight f6. Right, but right. If we could have played like bishop to d8, for instance, you know, it wouldn't have been that easy for you because you, we, would have been, we would have maintained our defense on that 7th rank. Right, so like, let's say I waste a move with king h2 and you play bishop d8, your rook covers f7, so there's no immediate checkmate, but still, there will, then I can flip back with like bishop to f6 and trade off those bishops finally. Right? It's all about this f6 square, and Tigre and Petrosian made it happen. This was a really instructive game, and I'm glad we were able to catch a good eye, Jen, for taking us over here. It's a really nice finish. Yeah, thank you, and I, I think I, I was kind of joking when I said that I like white because checkmate beats an attack on the queen side but it turned out that it was prescient yeah you know you are a fortune teller here you know you're seeing ahead you're, um so i was gonna say let's go over to this game between sparkle chess but then i realized who that is and i was like nope we can't go there we're still working on this commentator's curse experiment so we're not gonna That's look right don't do it at, her, don't do at it. her game so what other games are of note right now um well there's a there's Corrales versus Mikuleski, but that's not very interesting. That looks like it will probably be um, a draw. Uh, I am kind of interested, even though there's plenty of time left on the clock, I think the game between uh, the Zhu, Zhang Zhu, and Max Illingworth is pretty interesting. Okay, so Max Illingworth made a 15-move draw in his first game, and now we're on move 16. So he's already played a longer game in the second round. And whoa, what's happening here? White is up in a rook for a bishop but that queen on c6 is looking like it's black's trying to trap it and is it getting yeah. trapped it does wait so it's wait what is white's move and i'm and i'm but i can't play but you're saying i can't play queen a4 like i'm trying to get my queen out of dodge and i can't play queen a4 because then you'd have b5 which would um trap the lady yep completely so we kind of had to stick with this uncomfortable situation of being on c6. But after bishop e2, bishop d7, queen b7 force, is there a way to take away all our squares? Yes, rook b8, you'll take my pawn on a6, and I'll play bishop c6 and say, my next move is rook a8 no matter what, and you're losing that queen. Oh, there's no way out. There's no way to increase pressure on b6, no tactical ways out. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you could play knight. Right. You could play like knight a4 to try to attack b6, but then I can even play knight d7, or the simple rook a8 still should be very good because you play queen takes b6, and it'll take your knight on a4 and say, well, now I have two pieces for a rook in a much better position for me. You may have a rook and two pawns for those two minor pieces, but the dynamics certainly favor black. And let's see, you went bishop, so bishop e2, this is all happening. Rook b8. Oh boy, this is looks like home cooking for Max Illingworth. I, I don't believe he entered this without knowing it. And maybe he did, which is even more impressive, but I get the feeling that this was preparation on his part. Bishop c6, trap that queen. 
Okay, so I see a question about how this all works. So I will pull up the scene with the format so you know how this works. And there are teams from five continents, 32 teams in total, and there are 15 minute plus two second increment games that we've been watching, and all four players from all of these teams, they play each other in the game. So board one starts with playing board four, then plays board three, then plays board two, and then finally plays board one from the opposing team. And these are the 32 teams in the league with all their great logos. And just to pull up the, the standing, not the standings, the scoreboard for today's action, just to see how everyone is doing, you see that each team has four players. And some of these board ones, for example, Daniel Nerdiski has three points while other board ones are struggling. In the case of Evgeny Moroshnashenko, it's because he hasn't shown up. In the case of Xu Shang Yu, it's because this is his second game, and, well, he's in trouble in this one. But uh, very interesting to see how different boards score in this kind of crazy format. Oh, I have bad news for you. What's that? Uh, oh. I really thought it was going to work, our, our experiment, um, but I'm not sure it's going to in the end. So that means I shouldn't go over to her game. No, is... don't go. But it's probably my fault because I peaked. Oh, no. So it is the commentator's I... curse. It's real. No, I thought it was only if we went over that game like as commentators. I thought that if I like opened it while you were talking about how the league works, it wouldn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So I mean... bad. I can't believe I did that. I'm so sorry to so <laughs> all you fans out there. I didn't think it worked that way. Yep. God. And uh, I, I didn't think it worked that way either, and I still don't for the record. But in this game, this does work. Rook eight is a queen trap. So play rook eight, win a queen on a6, be very, very happy if you're Max Illingworth in this game. So people are yelling at you. They, they <laughs> they're having a good time getting mad at you over here. This is funny. <laughs> Yes, we do have a lot of angry faces at me. But, but, you know, that's okay. That means that they're Naomi fans, so I understand. And we broke 10,000 Twitch viewers, actually, here. So welcome, everyone. I know that you're not all chess players, so we love the new, new player questions. It's really awesome because it shows that we have people who are interested enough to kind of watch, even though they don't know chess yet, Yep. and ask a question that indicates they've never watch chess before which is kind of brave yeah so keep it up and please ask questions because you know i always say this to my students and i really mean it when i have them go over things i say just to say whatever's on your mind and in retrospect you would be like oh well that doesn't work at all how could i suggest that but no idea is stupid it's stupid not to have ideas so please if you have questions about the games we'll try our best to answer them but certainly be involved and um you know we really appreciate everyone for tuning in and watching the this week's Pro Chess League action. That's right. And, you know, even if Robert and I are engrossed in some games and we can't get to your questions, there's other moderators in the chat. There's Commissioner Greg Shahadi. There's a lot of great people in the chat who might be able to help you out, yep. if we, even if we can't get to every question. So for sure. Keep it up. And it looks like right now we're in a kind of a, a spot where there's not a lot of huge time scrambles, except, well, there is that game. But that's over, the game between Ailingworth, it looks like he's just up a queen. Uh, so we maybe want to just sink into a game that might get interesting later so that we can go over some of the strategic ideas. Yeah, for sure. How about this game between uh, Conrad Holt and Vinay Bot? Because Vinay's games have been very interesting, as have Conrad yeah. Holt's. And all pieces remain on the board in this position. So there's a lot of tension in the center. And Jen, I mean, you know, you've been coaching for a long time. How, how would you best explain, when you see a position like this, how you think about that mass in the center? Well, you have to be constantly vigilant because you can't just say, oh, it's not, it's, it's okay for me if uh, they take on d5 or they take on e5. You need to recheck every move. So that's why so many players have difficulties with this kind of um, duality of tensions, right? There's a tension of capturing on d5 and on e5 and you can capture on d4 and an e4. Yep. And so players tend to release the tension because it's so hard to bear to recalculate the moves every single, every single move. So that's kind of how I think about it, that it's rare because usually people like to just clarify the position in one direction. Yep. 
and, and One Direction doesn't exist anymore as a band, so you maybe shouldn't do that, right? You know, they're, they're done with, so maybe you should also be done with One Direction. And, uh, Night changes, yeah, right. <laughs> no, it is a very important point, though, is that you always have to be calculating and recalculating, because let's say you make a move like pawn to h3 instead of, we, just, we did just see the captures, but let's say you play h3. That may seem like an innocuous move that doesn't threaten anything, but like you said, Jen, you always have to reconsider. Maybe they change a little something that influences these captures in the center. So Conrad Hall decided to capture immediately. It makes perfect sense. But when you trade pieces, the side that previously had less space has more room to breathe. And if we just go back to after knight f5, bishop f8, you know, this white knight is an f5, looks very advanced. The bishop on b7 isn't really doing all that much over there. Um, the knight on d7, knight on f6, they might be stepping on each other's toes. So now you see that, okay, now this bishop on b7 is about to see some new life in the position once I take back on d5. It will have a longer diagonal to work with. If you take on e5, then my knight springs right into the action by taking back on e5. So those are the, some dynamics that help black. And look at this move, e4, saying, I am going to win this pawn back on d5 anyway, so let me try to go forward with e4. But White can try to keep this pawn and play bishop c4, saying, well, actually, you're not going to have a very easy time getting this pawn back, and I'm going to be happy to play. Oh, ignore me, because it didn't happen. But, you know, I was trying to say that White could have played bishop c4 here and met a6 with a4, and then played knight f5 to e3, and said, I am keeping this pawn whether you like it or not. Yeah, I think that this looks... If you could be either color here, which color would you be? It's hard to say because I'm not going to like having an isolated pawn on d4, but I think the immediate position has some elements that favor white. And for example, let's say knight takes d5, knight d5, bishop d5. What I'm starting to like for white is that actually my d pawn is mobile. And what I hate about isolated pawns is when they're totally blockaded. But I think maybe I can play knight to e3 and then try to push for d5 myself. Or I like the fact that my pawn on d4 dominates this knight on d7 a little bit, so I play queen e2, then play rook to c1. I cover the a6 square, so I can I have some light square control, and that seems to be in white's favor. So I would say I'd take white, but in the next few moves, don't be surprised if I change my mind and start liking black's position. No, once you commit, you have to stick with it. Well, except, as I always use, as this is my example, I was playing John Fedorowicz in a World Open game many years ago. And I had this line that I was checking and rechecking. I spent 45 minutes on it. And then I realized it was a bad line, but I played it anyway because I spent so much time thinking about it. So I learned my lesson that sometimes, you know, in, in, instead of committing, you should go about acquitting. Maybe? No, does that work? That, that's called the sunk cost fallacy. Just because you spend a lot of money on a house or a bad investment, yep. still chuck it away when it's no longer good. Yep. So, okay. I see your point. Just don't be afraid of, don't be so afraid of commitment. <laughs> I agree with you on that note as well. And if my mom is watching, I'm sure she might say the same thing. So. Well, redheads, redheads. Yeah, my, mo my mom is a redhead, exactly. So, yeah, so rookie six played. I like that move. Defensive move, threatening rook to g6 as well. So it can turn defense into offense really quickly. And, well, okay, it's a very interesting dynamic here between Holt and Bot. Another game that intrigues me, just because it's with two of the stars of the night, is Jeffrey Zhang and Daniel Naroditsky. Uh, incredible bits player versus one of our top American players. Y and, you know, saying one of our top American players when we have, of course, the big three of Wesley So, Hikaru Nakamura, and Fabiano Caruana, all members of the Pro Chess League, yep. along with... Uh, Sam Shanklin, our U.S. champion, and now also adding Lanier Dominguez. That's quite a title. You know, he's probably in that number six, number seven position, right? Yeah, and he's really phenomenal. And, and actually, I'm looking at this position with his, in his game against Nerdisky right now, and it reminds me of a huge success, his career highlight, I would say, from the Isle of Man tournament, where he drew against Krumnik, he drew against Nakamura, uh, he beat Richard Report. He had a, such a great showing there. In the last round, he was playing against Gawain Jones. And this reminds me, I think he was on the black side of that game, actually. But it reminds me of that game. And I, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm trying to sink deep into the memory bank for that one. That's right. Um, Jeffrey had just such an extraordinary performance in the Isle of Man. I think he had like some 2,900 performance or something. Yep. Yeah, he did. Oh, he actually was the white side of that game. So maybe that was 
this was Daniel Nerdzicki's prep was looking at that game against Gawain Jones and using that to help his chances here. I mean, it, it ended up being quite different than that game, but the opening was the same. So right now, the knight is being offered this trade, I should say, and if I'm black, well, I hate the fact that the C file is so under white's control, right? Because the rook c8 is not coming with my bishop and my rook teaming up on that square. And if I can't get in rook c8 and you can follow up, you know, trading the knights with rook to c6, you might just be clamping down on the queen side and I'm in some big trouble. Oh, I like white. Yeah. I mean, I just feel like this position, it's so hard to get activity. Look at how all the business squares are covered by white's pieces. I want to play rook c8. I can't. I want to play knight f4. I can't. Mm -hmm. I want to play knight g4, knight c4, I can't. There's so many things that I would love to do, but you're just blocking me in every direction. Yeah, and right here, knight takes d3, queen d3, knight f4 is still not working. The square is covered because queen d4 check, right? We've talked about this a lot. Sometimes you don't have to defend a piece or a square directly as long as you have a threat that follows up that will um, be good enough as a sort of defensive uh, move anyways. A queen d4 check would pick up the knight on f4, which means that that square on f4 will remain defended. Uh, otherwise, black would be very happy to play for knight f4 and take that bishop on h3. It's just a miserable position. I could play knight takes d3, queen d3, follow it up with king g8, but you have so many different ways to stop knight f4 at that point. So f6 was Naroditsky's choice, but... Oof. Rook c7 is like asking to be played here. Just put my rook on the seventh rank, pin that pawn on e7, so he took on e5 first, and now if d takes e5, well, rook c7, okay, took there, so d6, all, ooh, d6 might be great. d6 might just be winning on the spot now. Oh, yes, d6, the idea that pawn takes d6, you have rook c7 check, and then a queen is landing on f7 with a thud. Yikes. And that mate on h7 is uh, unstoppable once you get your queen and rook on the seventh rank there. He didn't play it. He played e3 instead, dominating the knight on h5, but, I mean... The problem is, like, it's not, it's not even that easy to stop d6. You could play rook d8, sure, stop it directly, but rook c7 then, and uh, life's not happy there either. Right. I guess at least you could maybe hang on by the nick of your teeth there with king f8. But you can't. Then I play d6 anyway, and if you take with the rook, there's rook c8 check, winning the queen. If you take with the pawn, there's queen f7 mate. Yep. Just seems like even if your opponent, that's the very frustrating thing when you're in a position that's so bad <laughs> that even if your opponent doesn't play accurately you're still just you know screwed in every direction yeah it's really painful and honestly like queen d8 here trying to say uh get your queen to d6 for example uh but then you also have rook c8 if you want is white saying you have to take my rook otherwise you're losing your rook on e8 and well i can trade off my rook and bishop for your queen that's going to be a winning position as well so here on queen b8 to not allow this rook c8 move or anything of the sort but rook c6 here just Double on the C file, play rook C6, follow up with queen to C3, then play rook C7 at the right moment, and, I mean, black is just hopeless here. But, whoa, what's at stake here? Note that the mechanics only need half a point to secure the match victory, Robert, and it looks like Minnesota Blizzard also already got the job done, so what a wipeout today. Yeah. Um, Blizzard versus Sluggers, huge victory, and... You know, it looked like Naomi literally could have won three of her games, so this match could have been a heck of a lot closer. Yeah, and the all-star MVP, again, appears to be Thomas Beardson, who is 3-0. He beat the two GMs on the... Wait, three GMs? How many GMs do the Sluggers have out there today? But however many they have, he's beaten them all, and Thomas Beardson, MVP in my book. Well, yeah, George Orlov feels like he could be a GM, but he's not. He's an IM, so the two GMs and the one IM. So, you know, now it's a disappointment, right? Instead of being three GMs, you only be two. I don't care about you anymore, Beardson. Your best is behind you. <laughs> I'm over you. Incredible performance. Seriously, shout out to the Blizzard for getting the job done so early. But, you know, we might have a close match on our hands in the other two matches I think the uh, particularly the surfers versus the hackers, anything could happen there still. Yeah, and we can head over maybe to some of their games. I see Azoria playing against Elshan Muradiabadi, and at first glance, there are two things that I noticed: isolated pawn on d5 and a rook on h1, which leads me to believe that White did not castle in this game, but instead went king f1 to g2 because otherwise, why is this rook on h1? And Jen, when I see a position like this, I think of several things, but one of them I think about is. 
um, just I'm just gonna make sure you never play d5 to d4, and I'm gonna put a rook on d1, maybe double in the d file, and I don't know how you're gonna keep this pawn on the isolated queen file. Right, so you're really liking this then. Yeah, I'm loving it. Yeah, I think you're right. I think this is a rough position for Elshon, who, great guy, not so great position right now. <laughs> No. And actually, can I just go ahead and take that pawn on d5? Is that like a free pawn, or am I getting myself with some kind of tactical issue? Come on, Yaz. <laughs> yeah, right? I, yeah. This, uh, of course, when you take a pawn, I have to think of uh, yeah. Yaz. I'm right. the greediest pawn grabber you've ever met that's not on the Pittsburgh pawn grabbers. <laughs> knight takes d5 did happen. He got it done. He took a that pawn. Now, the nice thing is after knight d5, queen d5, Knight takes f3. We don't have to take with the king because the queen is connecting suddenly with the, that diagonal. Yep. And if you try to play knight takes f3, knight takes f6, check in between move, and you're just completely busted. Yeah, that's just going to rip open your king side, and then I'm going to go ahead and probably win that double f6 pawn anyway. So, yeah, this looks like a very clean game for Izoria, who is a very strong player, and he also plays poker. Right, Jen? Oh, yeah, he used to be a professional poker player. I think he's getting more back into chess now, so welcome back. But, uh, yeah, I know you had Dan Smith on the earlier broadcast, and I saw there were some really cool games involving him. Yeah, he was playing some really interesting chess today, and he's beat Alex Shabalov, the many-time U.S. champion, earlier this year. So it's really great to see that poker chess overlap, including, well, you. <laughs> yeah, well, I love, I love seeing the overlap. I think it's just happening more and more now. Uh, it, and certainly, if there's anybody in the Twitch community who's from the poker world, you know, come on and say hello. Uh, as we did pop right over 10,000 again, we were over 10,000, we dipped back down and we hit the five figure mark again. So thanks everybody for making it happen. Well, actually, thank you only to 121 of you. <laughs> actually, yeah. we've actually popped us back over. Hey, well, you know, 10K is a good figure to have. And so, yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in again. Uh, please ask away, be active in the chat. We're keeping an eye on it there too. So um, thank you, thank you. And I see some subs and everything like that. Thank you to the moderators for being great in the chat. So thank you to everybody. And especially thank you to you, Jen, for joining me on this. What day of the week is it? Tuesday? Lost track of my days considering I've been seating in, seating in this chair for so long. But it's Tuesday, right? Yes, that's right. It is Tuesday. And yeah, thanks. Big shout out to Grandmaster Robert Hess for doing a double shift today. That means eight hours of commentary. And I know you love chess and you love the Pro Chess League, but everyone, that's not easy. I've had, I've, I think I've had like only a few eight hour days streaming um, at the St. Louis Chess Club before, but it's, it's really tough and almost with no break. So you still seem excited and that's pretty awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, I love the games here. And so, it's just so fun. The quick time control makes it even more exciting because you're like anticipating, will this blunder happen? Will they pull it off? Oh no, they're gonna lose on time. So that definitely keeps me energized despite the fact that, well, admittedly, I, I believe I'm quite tired when I'm done and I'm not in this chair anymore. I'm just gonna be like ready for bed immediately, just passing out. So yeah, thank you again for everyone, over 10,000 of you tuning in for this. So which games, so the mat, two matches well, are done. Right? Well, just for posterity, we should maybe watch um, Vinay Bat win against Conrad Hall to call the match officially for the mechanics. Because we've seen some bad luck for Vinay today, but yeah. he looks like he's going to be the, the clincher here. As I see that he has two pieces for the Rook against Conrad Hall. So the ultimate question is, is he going to be able to get his Knights out? Because this is a great example of Knights stripping on each other. The Knight on A2 cannot move without losing the Knight on C3. The knight on c3 cannot move without losing the knight on a2. So they're needed. They're, um, they're just they're Siamese knights in a way. Like they're just needed for the other one to live here. And I guess if you're white, can you consider playing king c2 to b2 to try to get that knight? But I think since you're also in a situation where bishop d6 will come and you lose your h2 pawn, I don't think you're really in time to uh, go for that path. But meanwhile, uh, somebody else did the job and clinched the match for San Francisco. I think it was actually Andrew Hong against Emily Nguyen that, that uh, called the match. So congratulations to the mechanics. They won their match against the Dallas Destiny. I wasn't expecting that kind of blowout, Robert, but it was just a very good day for Naroditsky 
and Zhang didn't have as good of a day as he usually did. Right. So I think that's a lot of what made it happen. Right. And so, yeah, v congratulations to the mechanics. They started off poorly to the season, but if Naroditsky is in this kind of form, well, it's going to be hard to beat them. And I don't like what Vinay has done in the last few moves. He could have went knight to d5, because the, the rook, the, excuse me, the knight on a2 couldn't be captured. But now when he went pawn to b4, his knight on a2 doesn't really have a great place to go. And that went to c1, but you're losing your b4 pawn. So things have not been going Vinay Bot's way today. Uh, we thought this would change in this game, but it doesn't look like that's the case. Because now all of a sudden, White has a rook and one pawn for the two minor pieces, and this B pawn is a pass pawn, and he just lost some time. So, Jen, um, commentator's curse, I believe, is very real, and we are proving it game after game. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. And, you know, I said Jeffrey Zhang's not having a great day, but it's honestly pretty cool that he's probably going to beat Daniel Nerditsky because um, that's at least a little bit of extra points and uh, pride for the Dallas Destiny, because otherwise they went down big time. Um, let's go look at some other games. Yeah, how about we, so the Blizzard match is technically over because they've won, but maybe let's just take a peek at some of their games because we're likely not going to get back to them since uh, they've already won the match. And well, I know we've kind of shortchanged Blizzard fans. And I saw the game between Corrales and Tigra and Petrosian where White is down a queen, but about to win it back. That's right. And we saw a couple of that really nice games from Tigra and Petrosian earlier um, in this match, but uh, the Blizzards are the ones that are getting it done despite that. we, Yeah, that was one of the games we saw, right? Tigran winning. Yep. Uh, even though the Blizzards are getting crushed in the match. So just kind of uh, strange that yeah. we looked at that game so closely. Uh, I, th yeah, I noticed also in the chat that the, we had a lot of Blizzard fans. I feel like sometimes the match that starts first, it has a little bit of a bias because due to the scheduling, sometimes we kind of get caught up in that. But yeah, this match certainly was an interesting one. Yep. And let's see. So wait, is Marash Shingo back? That's part of the question. I'm, I'm looking sort of in the internal chat going on. And is he back for the Australia Kangaroos? And if he is, that's a huge bonus for them because they've been hanging in there despite forfeiting uh, twice on board one. So I, I don't know. I'm going to get com waiting for confirmation on that. But Marash had forfeited two games for the Australia Kangaroos. Oh, and that game I was thinking of was Andrew Tang versus Tigran Petrosian. We took a long look at that one yeah. as Tigran managed to checkmate Andrew. And we also looked at a lot of the games that Naomi played um, against the various members of the Minnesota Blizzard until we stopped. And then we also looked at Thomas Beardson. So I think we gave Blizzard a fair shake. We yeah. just have some avid fans in the chat. And that's okay, you know, and a lot of these uh, teams actually have their individual streams too, where you can only focus on their games. So yep. if you're a super fan, sometimes you got to keep both windows open for that kind of thing. Absolutely, yeah. I know and Hikaru Nakamura, when he's playing, he streams his own games. And actually, Daniel Naroditsky is streaming right now his games for the San Francisco Mechanics. So lots of action and many streamers keeping you informed on what's going on. And this game between Fidel Corrales and Tigran Petrosian, okay, it's liquidated. We see an end game with equal material. And I think this one will fizzle out, so we can head off of this one for now. Um, where to go? Like, whose action is, you know, who, whose game is heating up? Which game, three to five in Surfers Hackers, four, four. Yeah, but it looks like Kingers. it's going to be maybe three to six, because remember that game versus Viata Zoria, where it seems like he's getting the better of the Surfer, Elshan Moradi Abadi. Um, so they, where are they going to get those points to catch up? I don't know. Uh, Shakriar Marmiliara for the Hackers, currently up in exchange against, wait, no. He is currently I got that wrong. down in exchange. Down in exchange. Down in exchange. Sorry, bias. I was like, he's so good. Somebody's up in exchange in this position. It's probably him. Is he just, is he just <laughs> losing? I think he's losing, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I just like, sorry, Malik. No offense to you. I just couldn't help myself there. Yeah. But it looks like Malik is just up in exchange. He's up in exchange for two, two pawns. But the biggest issue is not even the quantity of the pawns, it's about to be the quality. Because once this rook takes b3, yes. you're going to go ahead and lose the a4 pawn as well, most likely. And once you lose a4, that black pawn is running down the board. So, so king g7, now knight takes uh, e4. Looks very logical here. Actually, I'm wondering if I can play knight e8 check as well. Something that's 
sort of come into mind. Because if I go knight e8 check, and you go king g8, well then we just repeat it. If you go king h8, I'm thinking of even playing knight to d6, where I'm trying to win this f7 pawn, is it's a very important pawn to your position, is that it releases my e6, e5 pawn to go to e6. So something like that actually is very interesting here. And if I'm Mama Jerva, I'm definitely thinking about knight e8 check rather than knight takes e4, which allows the simple rook takes b3. And I feel like you're losing this pawn on a4 very quickly here. And that's obviously not a good thing. So he did go knight so e8 So good check. news, it does look like Miroshenko is back. OK, and he, did he draw very quickly? Yes, maybe. I'm not sure exactly what that was about. Maybe he's. If he just got back from his flight or something, he might have needed to um, do some logistic stuff. He drew a quick game, but at least he'll get to play the rest of the match. Yeah, so, well, okay, a half a point is way better than a zero, right? So at least, you know, he, just by showing up and drawing, he's doing more than he has been by forfeiting the other games. But yeah, right now. The other two games, and then he'll also get to play the last game as well. Right. So there's still one whole match left for the Chengdu Pandas versus the Kangaroos as they were the last to start. So obviously we'll be able to focus on them as that match looks like it's going to shape up to be the only close one potentially. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit too early to call on the surfers versus the hackers, but it seemed to me that with that point they're probably going to get from Azoria, um, and it's not at all clear that Melek's going to win this. Right. I, 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 they're going to be at a big disadvantage, right, going into the end. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if, you know, they need essentially Melek to pull this one off and Elshon to somehow survive, but that's a lot of ifs and, you know, hopeful thinking there. So it's going to be difficult for them, for sure. Well, we do have John Bryant versus Vinesh Ravuri, and that looks pretty sweet for John Bryant, who is up a pawn for what seems like nothing or even, you know, just a nice position for him. He's got the pawn and the compensation. All right, let me check that came out right now. John Bryant. Up a pawn and with a compensation, I think that's a great summary. White's pieces are marvelously placed. Um, you're up a C pawn. That C pawn can then start going from C5 to C6. And this looks like big trouble for Vanessa Ravuri here. Yeah, I don't think he's going to survive this one. He's outrated. He's down the pawn. His position doesn't feel very good. So, yes, John Daniel Bryant will get a win for the surfers, a much needed win, I might add. Yeah, it's very good because that, that's going to potentially keep the match close. Um, still, it, it looks like it'll be maybe maybe four and a half, six and a half or something like that. Yeah. But uh, at, least, at least something that we can still watch. Uh, but what happened here in the Mamadiara of Kachian game, there's been some simplifications. And Mamadiara now has those queenside pawns, but can Whoa. he keep them all? Rook A3 is going to snag the A4 pawn. Bishop D8, though. Look at that move. That way you can either push A5, or if you take A4, you lose F6 in the process. So, mm, Nice finesse there. And indeed, of course, he takes A4. You don't want those two connected pass pawns to live. So Bishop E7 to protect that pawn, and then put your Bishop on C5. But I don't really see either side losing this game, because the Bishop will sit on C5 to protect the pawn on B4. And... The problem for black in trying to win a position like this, there's no weaknesses, right? The, the pawns that are the base pawns are F2 and H2. H2 is impossible to attack. F2 is similarly impossible unless you somehow run your king from F7 all the way to E2 or E1. But look at that pawn on B6, right? I'm very happy to have that passer that's protected by bishop on D4. So there's no way black is winning this game. And white would be very fortunate somehow to win because I just don't see that happening either. You can play G5 here and try to shut that king out, but maybe if g5, white will go h4. So actually, there's still some work to be done here. Ooh, OK. But look at this move that just happened in the only game we hadn't looked at between the surfers and the hackers, um, the game between Hilby and Christian Carilla. Hilby just played a really cool move. OK, let me pull that game, the count. And... Whoa. The count, yeah. Hilby's just played the move bishop e4, check. The bishop on e4 was taboo because rook takes e4, queen f5 check, winning back the piece and I mean, winning in exchange um, in the end of the day. Uh, so we're actually winning the house. You just win everything, right? But <laughs> yep. instead, king h8 played. But yep. now queen g6 just hammering on those light squares. Yep. And that queen can go further and go into h7 now, followed by bishop g6. So I'd be very nervous about my king safety if I'm Christian Chirilla here. So queen e6 check was Hilby's choice, throwing this move in. 
Okay. Well, uh, maybe he's just trying to repeat once, well, but he's the one with more time, so. And King F8 would be a big blunder. King F8, Bishop D5 looks very powerful and menacing on that diagonal, so you can't really afford to do that. Uh, Bishop G6 yeah. probably also wins because you're threatening some mates, but Bishop D5 is stronger, I think. So he repeated once, but he's not going to repeat again. No way. He just did that to give himself some extra thinking time. Yeah, but how do you follow this up here? If you move your rook, you lose the f2 pawn. If you move your queen, well, where is it going? You just came from e6, so... Can you, so what happens if you play pawn to e6? That's a good-looking move. Queen g5 check. Yeah. Okay, that's not good, then. I don't know if I want to do that. Rook d1, much better. Getting another piece into the attack. Giving up the f2 pawn as well. So saying, I, I don't care about this pawn because the bishop on e4 covers the rest of the squares around my king, but that's a very risky move. But it looks brilliant in a way because now this rook, bringing another piece into the attack is going to really slice your defenses. Like if I play rook d8 and you now block on f8, queen h7 looks devastating. Yeah. So queen f2 check, king h1, but where's the follow-up? I'm not seeing it, if I'm being honest with you, because rook d8 check is a very annoying threat. Queen h7 check, similar. Um, but if there's no checkmate, then black has just escaped and won another pawn in the process. So where to move here? Knight e7? Per and then rook d8 check. Rook f8 is your plan. Yeah, like rook, rook here, rook f8, and then queen h7 check, king f7, and somehow I'm barely escaping. I don't know. Hmm. In nine seconds, he made a move. He did play, the, he did play knight oh, e7. Queen e6 check is also an option here. Okay, queen, queen e8 e check first. Oh, that's better. It just wins, wins of the night. Yeah, wow. Well, that's an easy way to do it. <laughs> I was looking for a checkmate, and Craig was just like, oh, I'll just win a knight, and you have to resign. Yeah, so, okay, he's trying so, to get counterplay with this pawn, though, right? Because that pawn is actually approaching. If I can go c2 next, I threaten queen f1 check, tr trading my queen for your rook, but then cashing in to get a, another queen on c1. So this is actually... And don't play rook d7 because there's queen f1 mate. Exactly. But what about, what about just rook g1? Ooh, rook g1, nice defensive move there. It's a defensive and aggressive at the same time. Hitting the pawn, that's actually a great move. Yeah, rook g1, yeah, I, very natural you, response here. You can't play g5 because queen h7 is just made on the board. And I'm threatening queen g7, mate. It looks like it's, you're a goner. You'd have to play rook f7, but then I just have bishop d5. Right, or you play queen f7 and hope I play bishop d5 because you take on d5 with check and then you win the game. Because bishop d5 is one of those moves where you're distracting the queen away from the g7 pawn, but in fact you're actually losing because that take with check. So queen f7 would be the response there, but uh, yeah, that doesn't look like it's enough. Even queen takes b4 in that continuation, and white's picking up some of these pawns. So bishop d5 check played, and now rook Oh, but maybe rook this is a better, even a better move order, potentially. Well, now at least g5 doesn't lose instantly because my bishop's no longer in the business square. Oh, what's that? Okay, so don't take this rook. Don't take the rook because then there's a perpetual check. Queen f3 check, rook g2, queen f3, and... Yeah. Wow, that's not going to make you want to subscribe to the Perpetual Podcast. <laughs> subscribe because... <laughs> but you should. Yeah, because... You should. Shout out to Ben. Ben Johnson is great. He, he runs a great show there. But yes, that, that is funny. That's not a... That's not... That would not be a good decision here. Queen E6 played. So what's he doing here? Queen G6. Okay, just going for the G7 pawn. This way you can't... Okay, checkmate in one. Queen G7 is mate. There we go. Check another checkmate in one. Craig will be making the match a little bit closer as the surfers get a very needed point. The hackers already have six and a half points. Do you know why? Because Mama Jarv won that game. Oh God. Oh my. Yeah. How did? That... I... Let's uh, flip this board around and see. Cause... Not that I have anything against Mama Jarv. I just, you know, I. I wanted the match to be close. Yep. So at a certain point, I'm just rooting for everybody who's on the, on the side with fewer points, right? Yep, you're, you're rooting for the underdogs. Okay, and he lost because, well, that pawn just went down the board and queen, the H pawn. He, by playing H5 in this, thing, this structure, he allowed white to go use the B pawn as a decoy, just kind of threw it away, and then took the G pawn and rushed the H pawn down with the help of his king and bishop. So that's an unfortunate loss for Melakachin, who played a great game, but... Um, yeah, like you said before, sometimes playing a great game isn't enough, and, well, can't congratulate him on that since he lost. Yeah, tough, uh, tough match, certainly, there for the San Diego Surfers. Do they still have a shot? Um, hmm. 
Well, see, well, John Bryant is still playing his game, and he's. That's the last game of the. Uh, that's the last game of this. Of this, yeah, this round, yeah, because uh, actually Elshon drew his game, so he managed to hold that really tough position down a pawn and make a draw. So that's huge. Oh, okay, so that helped. Yeah, that was huge for the surfers, and this game also will be similarly huge because, well, John Daniel Bryant's still up a pawn. He has a better position. He can trade rooks on d8. He could have done that last move and maybe should have. But G4 is a threat. Ooh. G4 just winning a piece. Nice. nice. There we go. Okay, so John Bryant. Okay, that's what I was missing because I thought that it was like the surfers was doing well in another game, and I'd forgotten about this one. Cool. So this is going to be a little bit tighter than going into the last round. Yep. Yay. Exciting. Five and a half, six and a half, right? Yeah. No, we're going to have a close one here. That's for sure. And when John nice. wins. Well, that'll be really exciting. And it looks like the match between China and kangaroos, the Czech Dupandas and the kangaroos is also going to be pretty exciting. But look at that game between Bao and Song. Yeah, I just uh, pulled that one like up. Completely wild. What is happening here? There's a queen on G2 where knight on F2 protects the rook, but knight E4 played to distract the knight. He didn't get distracted, but if he, uh, sorry, if she had taken on E4, then she loses her rook on H1. And so after rook f1 here, now the question is how to continue? Because I can take either your knight on f2 or bishop on d2, but no, neither of those look like a knockout punch. And if that's the case, then maybe black's not quite as ahead as it, it seems, but it looks amazing for black. You're also up a pawn, and white's king is just running. And this is looking sketchy. Looking sketchy for... For white? Yeah, it's for, black. Know, for white. You're just you're down a pawn, your king's on D2. Yeah. Your knight's on A3, not doing much. Yeah, unfortunately, it's just looking too solid. It, it, it looks so exciting, but too solid. This move, queen A5, hitting the bishop on F5. But if we just move it, not clear you have any kind of follow-up here. Right. So, like, if you play bishop G6, or maybe play pawn C5 blocking the queen off that bishop and trying to open up the center. Both of those look reasonable. Um, but yeah, bishop g6 is the very calm move, just protecting your piece, putting on a safe square, and just trying to follow that up with further advances. Yeah, this looks very, very bad for Bao. And meanwhile, the, game, the remaining game in the China Kangaroos match looks likely to be a draw, although something interesting just happened with a, an exchange of exchange of minor pieces, and now we have a bishop versus knight endgame with even pawns. Yeah, they did a funny way to exchange pieces, and now the knight against the bishop, and the pawn structure is better for black, that's for sure, but the, having the knight can be very advantageous when facing a bishop, because your knight can go from color to color, and for example, if this knight could go to d6, well, there's no way possible that you can kick that knight out because the bishop's on a light square. But if I'm white, I'm, f5 is a good move. Then I'm going to consider playing king f4, g4, h4, h5. So I'm just going to start pushing my king and pawns on the king side and then play for f6, essentially. Try to break a pass pawn over there. Yeah, there's something about this very specific pawn structure that seems good for the knight. I, I think it's like partly that... It's hard for you to get your king in. The white pawn structure does a good job of blocking that king from coming into d6 and d5, even though doubled pawns, but I'm not sure they're bad here. Yeah. Yeah, it's the, the, the pawn e5 in particular is good because it stops the king from coming into d6 and also supports this f5 to f6 move, which tries to create a pass pawn. There are many uh, motifs where you sack a pawn to... You know, just get this outside pawn as quickly as possible. H4, H5, G4, King F4, F6 are all moves that are, I think are going to come to be in this game. But it's not like black is just going to sit there and do nothing. Black can start playing on the queen side with A5 and B5 and start trying to push pawns there. So it's going to be an interesting dynamic as this game comes to a close. Meanwhile, Andrew Tang looks like he's getting a victory versus Mike Mikhail um, Mikalevsky, Victor Mikalevsky, but it's not going to matter... The Blizzard um, have already clinched their match, so this is just going to be icing on the cake, but nice little win there for Andrew. Icing on the cake is a great um, idiom for the Blizzard, right? You get some, That's right. Just, it works perfectly, but yes, this is um, very easily... Vanilla icing, right? <laughs> exactly. 
And yeah, the knight on h5 is trapped, which is just a funny place to be trapped on. And okay, you just take the knight, then you go checkmate the king. Seems like an easy task here. Uh, I had an icing party once where everybody brought their own icing and we had to rank which ones were the best. Which was the best? Using pretzels. Yeah, pretzels, cupcakes. People kind of like spread them on different things. Sounds delicious. I'm getting pretty hungry, so. Buttercream. Something with buttercream and like some kind of cognac. Or like not not cognac, Kahlua. Oh, that sounds great. It does, right? (laughs) Sorry. Robert really needs a drink and a cupcake, guys. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) That's, uh, At the same time, it makes it even easier, right? That would be great. I mean, honestly, I don't really want any more to drink. I had dodgeball last night, and we won the championship. I actually got my trophy right here. Let's see. Wait, you won a dodgeball championship? Yeah, my team is great. We won. So here's the trophy. Wait, where? In New York? Yeah, it was like Sandlot Sports, and this is the trophy that we won. And um, we had... Uh, it was, you know, every uh, every Monday it was best three out of five, and then you played two different matches in the day. I won the best catcher in the dodgeball league, so I got they gave me this plate from Sandlot Sports that you know clearly took a lot of time to make, and it's a thought that counts. So, for the wow, week- are you like the best combined dodgeball chess player? Did they throw rooks at you? <laughs> if they threw rooks at me, then I would have to consider: do I take the rook or do I let it slide? So that would be hard for me, but. Um, the thing about dodgeball, which is great for me as someone who's pretty short, it's actually really great because um, it's much harder to get me. And I'm, you know, in general, not to brag, but I guess I'm going to have to now, but I'm a pretty good catcher, which is why I won Best Catcher Award. So it's not easy to get me out. So dodgeball is amazing. We had a fun time at the bar afterwards, but here I am still doing eight hours of chess commentary the next day. So. Wow, wow, well, very great. And, you're, and you're, you're keeping up the energy, Robert, so that's awesome. Don't throw anything at him. He's going to catch it. You can't <laughs> throw a tomato at this man. Well, you know, I saw, I, I caught that the forfeit <laughs> win was given to the wrong team. And, you know, I, I catch things. That's what I try to do. And I try to catch good variations on the chessboard. So, speaking of, we have the last rounds, no, sorry, the third round still for Chengdu and Australia and the final round underway for San Jose and San Diego. And both of these are very close matchups. And we got a, a couple of comments coming into the chat. Armenia Eagles is chiming in, our defending champions here at the Pro Chess League. Shout out to the Eagles. Yeah, they're an amazing team led by their manager, Artak Manukyan. So always good to see them in the chat. And they're doing great this year too. The Tbilisi Gentlemen and the Armenia Eagles, both at the top of the scoreboard in the Eastern Division. Yep. But but leading by such a wide margin, number one and number two, um, and the the teams behind them are, are dozens of points behind. Yeah. So kind of similar to the Atlantic Division, where you've got the Marshals and the St. Louis Archbishops, but even more extreme. Right. Right. Actually, I'll pull up the standings right now just to emphasize what we're talking about and give a visual demonstration there. And here you see so. Um, the Armenia Eagles behind the Tbilisi gentlemen, but they would be first in any other division. So it's just unfortunate for them that, well, another team competing with them for the division title is just doing so darn well. And can- but guess what? They're playing on Thursday, and the Armenian Eagles wants, us, wants me to say that they're going to win the encounter. Well, good luck. Good luck. Yeah. And you, is that the one you're going to be calling with Anna, or are you going to be doing... Um, um, the later match? I'm doing the earlier one. So yes, I have the Eastern okay. Division with Anna Rudolph on Thursday. So you'll be calling that match. Wow, that should be an interesting one. As we've got, as you mentioned, we've got the the surfers, hackers openings um, just getting started. Yep, and we have the game between Illingworth and um, Chu Wei Chow still going on here, and actually a very instructive end game that we were talking about before. And actually, right. exactly what we were talking about for both sides has happened. Black has pushed this a pawn, and now white is pushing on the king side. And I think something that I'm going to illustrate on the queen side over here. It's exactly the kind of plan I was trying to get on the king side. Let's say I go king f4. Black plays b5. And let's keep going and ignore black's plan and play g4. When all of a sudden, when black plays c4, the idea is that if I go, let's say, g, uh, h5, then maybe black plays b4 with the idea of going c3 and just sacrificing pawns to make an outside pass pawn. And that's a very common uh, thing that you have to watch out for in end games where you give up a pawn on b4, play for an outside pass pawn. Now here it might not necessarily work, but it is something that you always have to keep an eye out for, and actually it does work because the knight will not be able to 
come back and stop the pawn as I could sacrifice my bishop and promote my a pawn into a queen. So I know that was pretty complicated stuff, but in pawn endgames, don't necessarily think of the recapture always. Sometimes you sacrifice one pawn to create a quick past pawns. The quality of the pawns, not always the quantity of pawns that matter. Heck yeah. Definitely in the end games when the, the pawns are in general, I'd say that that's a really important principle. And uh, I know you called the Atlantic Division earlier today and that the, the Marshals actually lost. So things being a little bit tighter in the Atlantic Division as the New York Marshals also chime in in the Twitch chat and say that the Chengdu versus Australia match should be an outstanding finish. Yeah, we're kind of lucky that this is the last match, Robert. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because they also started a little late, so I think we'll actually just be able to totally focus on four games, which is kind of fun. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have the surfers, hackers, and the Kang. I mean, this is great. I love it. For me, I think the most deflating thing is when you're doing a match and it's been really exciting, and then those matches end early and you're left doing, you know, two the last two rounds of a match is you know, 10 to 1 or something. And it just you know, it takes a little bit out of you. You always want to see it to be competitive, and that's what we're getting with these final two matches here. So um, this is the third round of the Chengdu Australia match. And is, it looks like that game is still going with Bao, but I think all hope is now lost. And Rook B2 check is coming in that game. Yeah, she's completely busted here. She's going to lose. Yeah, unfortunately, that those pieces are flooding into the position, and the king on d2 is being um, sorely punished. As I'm trying to sink into these openings between the surfers and the hackers, but hard not to take a look at Mamidara's games, as, of course, he's the biggest star here of the, of the round, super grandmaster playing through the ha hackers, versus Elshan Moradi Abadi, who could make quite an incredible feat by saving this point or winning the game yeah. um, and perhaps saving the match for the surfers. Whoa. So can he do it? And we got Well, this kind of double-edged position is probably just what he wants, right? Because it adds some chaos to the position, which I think is good in a situation like this. What do you think? No, I agree with you because for Mamajorov, well, he, you know, he's a guy who loves chaos. He's like the Joker. You know, it's just like he really does, he thrives, honestly, in these kind of crazy positions. I can reflect on so many of his games, but in particular, I think of his game against Levon Aronian at the Olympiad, where it just got really nuts, like off the walls crazy, and then he won that game, which was a vital point for the Azeri team. And here, if I'm Elshan, I'm thinking, well, I know the type of player he is, but also let's think about the position. I do not want this A file to open up, so I'm thinking about playing B4 and just saying, you know, maybe you'll eventually break it open with C5, Actually, maybe you will just break it open to c5, in which case, I don't know. This is looking kind of tough. You think it's tough for white? Yeah, I'm worried about the queen side over here. Yeah, what if I play, what if I play for f6? f6? Yeah, that... You just can take it, right? I don't, have enough, I don't have enough pieces developed to get at your king. Yeah, hmm. but maybe you can do it. Maybe you can take on f6. Uh, f6, e takes f6, and then but queen takes c6. And, well, that's... Yeah. I, I'm trying to slow you down and create some threats of my own. But I really dislike that my knight on g1 is undeveloped. Yeah. And then eventually a takes b3 is going to happen, and your a file is going to be ripped open, whether you like it or not. It feels very uncomfortable. But this is a tough position for Elshan, I agree. He kind of has to come up with a plan here. Not easy, but it's not easy for either side, right? right. I mean, don't forget, Shaq's king is on e8, and castling doesn't look like that great either because you've got those two pawns staring you down on g5 and f5. But I got to agree that it looks, despite all that, it does look easier for black to play. Yeah, I think the real issue and is mainly a psychological one. Even if the position somehow isn't that bad, I don't like it. I think bishop takes f1 and c5 is good for black. But even, let's say, the position you put an engine, and it's like, oh, it's equal. The problem is that you know that you can play f6 or g6, but it doesn't. you don't see the concrete way that it makes progress for you. Whereas you see c5 coming, and oh no, c takes b4 is a huge threat. Oh, I can't take back on c5 because there's the bishop pinning the d-pawn uh, on that diagonal because the queen's there, and like if c5 happens and I have to take with my b-pawn, then isn't that b-file open for me to get checkmated on? So I just think that the more 
concrete or the, just the easier um, ideas to digest all come in Black's favor, and that's what makes that position so psychologically difficult to have on, uh, with the white pieces here. Yeah, that, totally. Great explanation. That's why you can't learn as much from an engine, because you need an AI to tell you how easy a position is to play, how easy it is to find the good moves. And like, I wouldn't doubt that AI will one day come up with that kind of evals, but right now we don't have it. Aren't you talking about chess and AI at MIT next weekend? Yeah, the um, Sloan Sports Analytics Conference is having a chess panel. Um, Daryl Morey, the general manager of the Houston Rockets, is also a huge chess fan, and he joined us for commentary during the World Championship, so that was a lot of fun. And he has he co-founded the uh, the analytics conference, and so chess is going to be a part this year. And we'll have uh, myself, Danny Wrench, I think, will sort of lead the panel and ask the questions. But we also have Grandmaster Larry Kaufman, who is one of the founding partners of Komodo. And we will have um, from Lila Chess, uh, Folkert, who is uh, one of their um, key members of their team on Lila Chess. So, you know, it's really cool to have this kind of you know, a researcher and developer and AI, along with me being, you know, I, I don't have any background in AI, so I'm not even going to pretend like I can really comment on things. But from a chess standpoint, I, would like, I hope I can add there because, of course, I've analyzed the games that AlphaZero has played, um, like in Stockfish, and having a lot of experience with engines, things like that. So it, it will be a very fun, interesting talk. Awesome. And that's going to be live streamed, or people have to be in in the conference to see it? That's a great question. I'm pretty positive they're recording it, but I don't know if that means it's being live streamed or they're releasing it after the fact. I will ask that question and uh, we'll post about it for sure. But um, yeah, 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 I'm sure it'll come up on the stream on Thursday too. Well, enjoy it. And let's see what's going on in the game between the Count and John Bryant as this one, as every game in this match is crucial and particularly on the surfers being that they're a point behind. Uh, can't really afford to lose more than one game. Where's the F7 pawn? <laughs> I'm like, this looks like a normal position. Wait, wait a second. Black's down a pawn, and there's a rook on F7. So I'm going to scroll back a little bit to see how we got here. Good point, here. good point. And yeah, it, it does look pretty good oh, for Christian. Look on move. It looks good for Christian. On move 12. You know, Black played A4, and White simply made the intermediate move. Bishop takes F7 check, and then captured the knight on B4. So an extra pawn for Christian really here and well it should he should be able to convert this because it's not an extra pawn that's in a rook end game no it's an extra pawn where the black king is going to feel a bit uncomfortable now that you're missing the golden pawn the f7 pawn white can play e5 at any moment including now uh, i would just castle for white castle king side but okay he's a more adventurous soul than i am and there goes e5 oh so this is great news for the hackers and i gotta say i just think they're gonna win this match then because seven and a half plus having Mamidarov on their on your team, it's it's uh it's too good. I think this is this is going to be a, a really would require a lot of epic saves and epic performances for the surfers to save it now. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be tough, especially with you know blundering upon F7 and, and then in this game, and let's check out the game on board four between Vinesh Ravuri and Craig Hilby because that will be an important one for the hackers. Vinesh Ravuri is outrated here by nearly 400 points, but, well, actually his position doesn't look very good either. I was gonna say it was, he was doing all right here, but, I mean, just the simple knight takes e5 in that game seems to be a big problem. You take back with the pawn on e5, black can just go queen to e7 or c7, and then put a rook on e8 and try to win this e5 pawn. So it looks very uncomfortable for Ravuri, even though he's down no material, black's just gonna gang up on this e5 pawn and win it, most likely. Yeah, it looks fantastic for Black. I agree. It's those two bishops. They're really just going to have fun. And it's not just that we have two bishops. It's also, look at those minor pieces on c3 and b3 and how ineffective they are. Neither of them are participating in the actions. They're literally like bystanders. That bishop on b3 bright, biting on granite, as we say, and the knight on c3 literally with no good answer squares either. Yep. And I think that's really the problem here for white. Not a good position at all. So that's good news. So that's a potential point for the surfers. Yeah, when one pawn dominates two minor pieces, you tend not to have a good position. Like you just very well to, to point out that this pawn d5 really just limits both of them, restricts, restricts it. So the surfers will gain this game, it seems like. And then let's see the other boards. Melek is playing against Izoria. And, well, 
So up a pawn for black. So black's just doing well on this board too. Yeah, so that's what that's a problem. So that this it looks like it looks like Melik won't win this and that therefore the surfer the surfers are gonna lose this match and the hackers will win a very tightly contested match. You know, it, and a lot of it could have potentially come back down to that game between Kachian and Mami Diara of last round. Yeah. Right? Now, if it wasn't for that, it would be ever so much closer than right now. Yeah, that was a critical game and one that the servers would love to have back because, well, he had a 2,800 player just in the jaws of defeat at a certain moment, it seemed like. And then, well, he not, not only, you know, he could have made a draw at any moment. He could have repeated moves. He went for a win and ended up losing. So that's going to be uh, really upsetting to Melek when he reflects on this match. And Elshan against Mamajarov, that is... You know, the player of the match, Mama Jara, but what is going on in this position, Jen? Oh, my. We should keep on this match because this one looks freaking insane all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, this pawn f6 can be captured several different ways, but if you take with the knight, you lose your queen. This rook on f8 is hanging, so if you take with the rook on f6, I could probably just play bishop takes f8 and get your rook there. So, um, what to do? If I take on f6 with my bishop, then I'm worried about my g-file, rook h to g1 with check, king moves to h8, and then there's going to be ideas of queen f3 takes h5 mate, or just rook to d5 threatening rook h5 mate. It's, everything is problematic when your king is out on the last file. This is just... Wow, well, this is awesome. Elshan Morati Abadi could pull up the upset here. This looks really good for white. Love that sack in return, though. Queen to, Rook takes oh, c5 yeah. by queen b8. That's really nice, because now if you play queen b2... I get to play bishop takes f6 first. And by playing bishop f6 first, I force you to trade queens on b8, which favors black, because I take on b8 with check. I follow it up by taking your pawn on c5. Black will get two, uh, a pawn and a bishop for rook, but with attacking chances as well. So, that, ooh, this is all happening here. And who do I like here? Well, rook g1 check. What rook g1 check first? First, nice move to include. You force the king to the last file, as we were talking before, and then rook d5 is still going to come. So now after king h8, mm -hmm. you simply, oh, this is nice. This is really nice. You take king h8, you take on b8, rook takes b8, king c1, knight takes c5. I have this rook d5 move, threatening your knight and threatening h5 with check. Oh, god, this is good for Elshan. Elshan could win this, yeah. which would potentially get the surfer seven and a half points. So even a draw potentially in that game with Azoria could at least give them a tie in the match. So, oh boy. I didn't see this coming, but Elshan looks like he's going to score, could score an incredible upset here. Knight c5, rook d5 is dead, which means that white's just up in exchange for nothing. Yeah, this is right? actually crazy. And not only do you up, you up the exchange, this pawn on c5 can start advancing, but a rook d5 here pins that knight. Uh, white can go then go knight f4 and bring that knight into the action. No, this is really bad, uh, just losing for Mamajarov. And Elshan Maradi Abadi, hero. Yeah. He saved that game against Azoria last round, and now he's going to defeat Mamajarov. Wow, what a performance by Elshan. But is, isn't Rook takes G7 here just good? Yep. Rook takes just G7. Win the wins it. There it is. There it is. Rook takes G7. Mami Diarov is totally dead. Elshan Moradi Abadi beats one of the top players in the whole world. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't this game that I said, great guy, not a great position. That was That was last round. Yeah. This round, we still we were worried for him because it looked easier to play for Shock. But there it is. Shock resigns the game. Go, Elsha. Yeah, that's a wow. career victory. And, you know, as someone who doesn't get the opportunity to play such high-rated players very often, for Elshan, I mean, this is just a, like a momentous occasion. And as a chess player, as a, with that competitive drive, any chance you get at playing some of the top players in the world, which is not often because most of the top players play in these closed round robin events, um, you know, in the Grand Chess Tour and in, in various top level events, which is great because there's bringing more money to the game. But at the same time, it's tough for the other GMs who are like, you know, I'm not as highly rated, but I can get them. If I get the chance to play them, I know I can take them down in a single game. And that's really what chess makes chess so fascinating is in a single game, anything can happen. Of course, if they play in a hundred game match, Mama Jarvis is going to destroy him. But in a single game like this, of course, Elshan Moradi is strong enough to upset the number five player in the world or whatever he's at right now. So really awesome to see.
Wow, and now we have to, to see if Craig Hilby can get the job done against Vinish, Vinish on board four, and are either of the other games holdable? Um, it looked really terrible for John Bryant last time we checked um, as he was just missing a pawn on F7, and it seems like that situation. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like he'll be doing well here, and the other game, as you just mentioned, is Mel oh, wait, what? What happened to that game? Because it looks like, it looks like somehow uh, Christian sacrificed a bunch of material to try to get the job done right away. But if he doesn't give checkmate, it might not be that easy, right? Wait, what's going on here? One, two. Christian sacrificed a couple pawns in order to try to get John's king. But the problem is, bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, queen h5. We win our pawn back, but is the black king really in that much danger? I don't know. No, I don't think so. In fact, if I'm black, I'd consider... No, I don't know if I want to do that. The move d5 is very tempting because it kind of forces white to take on f6. But by playing d5, I see holes in my position. So if, if I play d5 as black and this knight goes from c3 to d3, I'm like, that knight's jumping into e5 or c5 and I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable. But um, rook h8, knight e2. And now knight f4 is coming. So knight d5 would be my response. I guess you can play d5, getting, actually, again. We're getting a, um, a lot of reaction from the chat on that Elshon game. Greg says that he was watching on Zoom, and Elshon let out a big breath after the game. Sam Copeland of chess.com says that Elshon's incredibly talented. He was an Iranian champion as a teenager, but was denied chances to compete abroad and improve. There were some restrictions on where he could travel. Now, of course, he lives in the United States, so we're so happy to have him. Uh, and the Armenia Eagles also chimes in and says that you're very smart, Robert. <laughs> Everyone has a chance in a single game. Like in a longer match, Grandmaster Hess will beat me, but in a single game, I will beat him. So he actually beat me in a blitz game the other day uh, in Arena King. So he's bragging. He's uh, very happy about that game because it's funny. I was like... I. I was like, I can't lose the art talk. I can't lose the art talk. And then, of course, I lost the art talk. So, congratulations to him on that game. But yes, I mean, I still hold that point to be true in any single game. Um, you know, that's why I always tell people not to look at ratings because it's, it is, it, you, know, you get a ma it's math. It's math. If it, you're 2200, you're just as likely to play like an 1800 as you are a 2600. I mean, that's just. You know, that's why you're 2,200. And if you're playing someone who's 2,000, they can play like a 2,400 or play like a 1,600. That's why I always tell my students, do not focus on the rating. Focus on the board at hand. Rating is just a distraction for you to um, then take a subjective approach rather than an objective one. And actually, there was a question earlier by Cash Menke. Do you think some of these board fours are playing a different style of chess against board ones to try to pull off the upset? And I do think some board fours, um, they try to, like, if they're white, they just try to trade pieces off and say, if you're going to beat me, you're going to have to do something uh, risky to get that victory. Otherwise, we'll just make a draw and you're not going to be happy about that result. So people are, are suggesting that this is a good time to challenge you because you've been up the whole day and hung over from the dodgeball celebration. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the one thing Robert really wants to do after eight hours of streaming is to take on all comers, right? Yeah, right. You know, I'm always impressed when people do 24-hour streams because... I mean, that's just a lot of time and you know it's hard i mean I, I interviewed alexandra for the first episode of my new podcast ladies night yep. and she told me a little bit about her 24-hour marathon chess stream and i was just really amazed yeah by the way that podcast is excellent i've been listening i just saw the one uh, sorry saw i heard the one with uh, adi and yango as well so it's uh oh thank you i'm glad you're listening yeah she's pretty awesome but wow christian carilla can he get his knight to e5 here and I just need three moves. So knight e2 to f4 to d3, that sounds good. But black is trying to, you know, as soon as you move this knight away from g3, I'm planning my knight on e4. And that's an annoying thing to deal with as well. I think black is better here. You're up a pawn, I don't see a concrete way for uh, Chris and Chiril to win back the pawn. And now I would move my king away, king to g8 finally, now that my knight's protected on f6. Because you can't even take on f6 anymore. As soon as you take, I take with my bishop. You lose your rook on e5. So king g8 followed by knight to e4 is what I would do. And I think black is in good shape here. 
Yikes, this would be a huge win for the surfers if he's able to do it. But, you know, anything can still happen. I mean, it is a blitz game after all at this point. Right. But the trajectory of the game has certainly been in John Daniel Bryan's favor. He played terribly, to be frank, in the first 12 moves. But since then, he's actually played very well and posed a lot of questions that Trillis had a, had a tough time answering. So, yeah, this is nice for Black all of a sudden. And, you know, you might be playing checkers on the light squares with your pawns. But sometimes checkers is the way to go. Meanwhile, Kachian could hold this end game as well. And of course, that would make it a lot easier for the surfers to potentially get victory uh, by virtue. It's tied completely six and a half, six and a half. I should also say that the Chengdu pandas and kangaroos have just started their games, but this is too close. They just started. So we are going to wait till the surfers, um, hackers match shakes out until we switch over to that. Yeah, in this game here, Rook to B7 just played instantly by Melikachian. And his idea is to trade off the bishops and then plant that bishop on D5. Because that's the great thing about bishops, is their long-range scope. A bishop on D5 covers the A pawn from r rushing to A2, but also puts pressure on the F7 pawn, if I can get my rook to the F file, and takes away the A8 square from the rook on D8. So bishop is just such a powerful piece. And... When you put it on d5 like that, it will show. So now I play rook b6. I think rook to d7. Uh, now if I go rook b6 and try to threaten bishop b5, you're going to have a hard time with all these weird pins in the position. So if I just take twice and take on d6, you're saying... Oh, that, that's also an option. I'm worried about that a-pawn, though. Yeah, I know. I'm worried about it, too. I wonder how much... If this is based on instinct by Zviad and how much of it he's actually calculated, because that's always a question in these blitz games. Right. Um, yeah, this A-pawn's rolling real fast, and I, that certainly concerns me, which is why I like keeping the rooks on the board, because we talked about how knights step on each other's toes. These rooks kind of step on each other's toes as well. So rook to b6 says your rook on c7 is not moving anywhere as your knight's hanging. The rook on d7 is behind that knight on the diagonal, which means bishop b5 is going to be a very big threat, which attacks a4 and pins the knight on c6. So it's a very multi-purpose move. He takes on c7, and, well, I don't know what he's going to do next, because if you take on d6, I feel like the a a3 comes, and you can follow that up with rook to a7, and I have my rook behind my pass pawn. But if I don't take on d6, then what am I going to do? That's uh, the, you know, another question. Well, I take twice, and he hasn't taken on d6 yet. As we've also got the other three games still going on, um, the other two games, that is, still underway, still looking good for Craig Hilby against Ravrui. Ravru um, I have no idea what's going to happen versus Christian and John Bryant. Like, sure, Black looks good, but is it easy? Yeah. No. Because the position's so closed, right? Or yeah. do you think it is easy? No, 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 I'm agreeing with you. And I'm saying the game with Vinesh is easy because Black's up a piece and the open position favors him anyway. But the game with John Daniel Bryant, like, even if you go ahead and take that rook on c5, what Trill will do is try to put this bishop to e5 and claim control over all the dark squares. But if you're not landing a legitimate attack for white, I'll be happy to take your rook on c5 and then maybe go after your queenside pawns with an idea like queen d5 to b3 because, yes, I'm leaving my king side a bit vulnerable, but you have to prove that you have anything more than a couple of uh, desperate checks. Yeah, definitely, I agree. Rookie five play, but now bishop d6 could also win the bishop, and that's what John Bryant did instantly, keeping a pretty huge time advantage, and I'm definitely liking it more for him, thinking that I like his position, and he's also clearly ahead on the clock. Yeah. Bishop f4 now by Christian. The only thing he can do is sack the exchange, and so he's forced into kind of seizing these dark squares. And I guess the question is, do I have to take uh, on e5 right away, or do I have some useful move that just delays it? I guess if you play yeah. some other move, like rook to h7, the uh, h8 rook to h7, so that way when you take on e5, it doesn't hit your, um, your rook on h8. I don't know if white has any useful move to make after that. So he took on... But John just... John just took and then played rook h6. Not fearing queen g5 check, he just has king to h7 and all the business squares are totally covered. So that's why Christian immediately played b3. If he can get his rook into the party, life will be a lot happier. Yeah, and if he can win this a4 pawn, like, you know, take twice on a4 and win that pawn, well, all of a sudden, the extra material 
will be rook for bishop instead of rook and pawn for bishop. But this e pawn and this f pawn, at some point black would really like to play f4 or e3 and get those pawns rolling. So queen e7 here would be an offer, a queen exchange. But you're going to lose an a4 pawn in the end. So it's not exactly such a happy situation for black. Like if you like queen e7, oh, queen g3 check, and then just go ahead and take that pawn over there on a4. Right, so it's all coming down to this. Black is totally winning in the game between, in the hill b board. So that'll make it seven and a half for the surfers and six and a half for the hackers. Yep. But Azoria is doing well against Melek. And so basically it's all coming down to this game, but it's looking good for the, it's looking good for the surfers. Yeah, and Melek... It's all coming down to this game. Yep, Melek is about to lose, it seems like. Uh, Knight c5 just played, so he's losing a third pawn. So it'll be three extra pawns for black, and that's too many to deal with. But yes, yeah, so let's stay on this, this game between Chirilla and John Daniel Bryant, because look at the time situation as well. Chirilla has 15 seconds left, and he's down in exchange, but if he can land rook a8, it could be a knockout punch heading to the h8 square. So uh, black should play queen g5 here, and that seems to almost force Ooh, the queen that's, exchange. That's a good one. Yeah, I think just queen g5 one. here is, is the move you need. Liquidate. Yeah, because it looks like we're going to be at seven and a half, seven and a half, and this is going to be the money game. And John Bryan looks like he's going to be riding the wave for the surfers. <sighs> yeah, riding the wave is right, and the, uh, looks like it's, a good tide out there for him to get this one going because right now queen g5 you go queen f2 you're going backwards right then black goes f4 and just launches a huge attack so it looks like it's all over and he just has to play some queen g5 you don't want to allow that white queen to stick around too long and then face repercussions okay wait bishop d6 he walked right into oh no oh my god oh no he walked right How'd into that there. happen he went rook f8. Instead of queen g5. Because he was worried about rook a8 in some way. Maybe he was worried. I, I don't know. There's like no real. But bishop e6. That was just so obvious as a response. Oh, and actually, now we're just... I can understand why he missed it, Jen. He was so fixated on this bishop e5 covering the h8 square that he might have just forgot that bishop can still move. Oh, gosh. Yeah, maybe. But queen c7 checking now. What about... Queen g7, is the game over yet? No, it's not over yeah, because queen c6 is not that easy because I just take on g2. Right. So this is still completely up in the air. And if you go, well, okay, rook a7 played. So rook takes g2, he wants to move his queen out the way. So rook g2, queen b6, pinning the queen. But And that'll be a draw. Yeah. Rook g1 check, rook g2. Yeah, there's, actually, I think that's going to be the likely outcome. If I'm, oh, he took on, no, that's a bad move. Ooh, take on c6. No. Take on c6. Play. Why did John Bryant do this? He should have gone for the draw. So play F3 here? Because the E pawn's not rolling. If E3, okay, that's also probably a good move. But now rook E5 hits both E pawns. He still can try F3, and that way he can push his pawn to F2, perhaps. No, I mean, of course, Ten, it still could be a draw. Nine. But I, oh, my gosh. If he saw the force draw, that was definitely the way to go, because white is the one who's got chances now. Yeah, white's probably just winning at this point because now e6 is hanging, the b pawn's just rolling forward. So f3, king g1 here. All right, he just ignores it all. Wait, what's he doing? He's losing the b pawn. Rook b6. Rook He's b6. losing the biggie. What is he doing? What are both of these guys doing? Rook... They're trying not to get flagged, Robert. So rook takes b7. Okay, that's probably the wrong move again. B... Get a queen. Yes, yeah, so you have to get the queen first and then king g2. Whew. I thought he was black and was about to win. We have time to make a knight. I guess that wouldn't have been good. Oh, that would have been awesome to see though. Get a knight because it's check. He also probably or is. Then king g one would have been fine. Yeah. He also probably has auto queen on, so he probably didn't even realize like how to do that in the time that it was. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah, and I don't know if it was a good move or not. By the way, this is seven and a half, seven and a half. So this is the money game. If Christian wins this game, he will win the match for the hackers. Yeah. And. There go the pawns, rook. b5. How can you stop both these pawns, Robert? You can't. Rook takes h5 with check. And there it is. Oh, my God. So what's he do now? Whoa, no, no, no. That's not a good move. He just gave away his very important pass pawn. Now rook what? takes d5. Take rook on d5. Takes d5. The king gets back to the corner. Oh, no. Take it. Take it and play king f5. Immediately a draw. 
Okay, or not. But, okay, that's fine too. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just. <laughs> yeah, this is, you need to cut the king off, the black king off like five files in order to win this. So this match is going to be a tie, and that feels kind of fair, I guess. I mean, I don't know. You know, Elshon won, I mean, won that game, yeah. which is awesome against um, Mama Jarov. But, whew, what a match. And what a crazy last game with so many turnarounds. I mean, unbelievable. And this is so important to both teams. Wait, wait, wait. wait. He's oh. blundered. Oh, my God. No, he blundered. The h bonds to the queen. <laughs> what? Oh, my gosh. Commentators That's why you go for the pawn hang game. Oh, my God. Commentators Christian curse. Gorilla. Christian Gorilla is going to do it for the hackers. Wow. Um, I don't even know what to say about that. That is epic as epic comes. Wow, Christian Gorilla, after a series of turnarounds, has won this incredible match, defeating the San Diego Surfers and keeping them down in the standings of the Pacific Division. And that, that was so crucial because, Robert, the San Francisco Mechanics just won yep. a huge match. And the Hackers were just in front of them in the standings. So they would have leapfrogged them uh, if it wasn't for this victory. Yeah, and people wrote off the mechanics early in the season because most of their top guys couldn't play and they were really struggling. Then Sam Shanklin came back, then Negi was playing, and narodissi has been uh, you know, an MVP candidate. So the mechanics are back. I'm going to pull up the standings really quickly before we get to the last match just to show you that the me that mechanics were in seventh place with 108 points. And if the hackers lost, the mechanics would have leapfrogged them. But the mechanics are going to go ahead of the Sluggers, who lost their match, and will be right behind, it seems like, or maybe they'll somehow jump ahead of some of these other teams, and they will be in contention for the final playoff spot. So a still long season left, despite being near the end. I'll pull up the schedule once more. Um, you see that the remaining game's left until the playoffs. So basically, the point is Elshan beat Mamadiara for nothing. Yes. <laughs> Stop. Mm -hmm. No, that's just not right. It's not right that's at all. Not right. No, it's not right in the slightest, but that's some, something what happens. Elshan beats Mamajarov, and it's a thankless victory for him. Oh, that's, a, that's funny. Of course, I actually, I mean, it's hard. The nerves, the having to play quickly, fearing losing just on time, which is obviously the worst thing that can happen. Yep. Uh, I, I, I really do feel for John Bryan in that situation. But let's take a look at some of the games from the Kangaroos Pandas match because that's that's what we've got remaining. Yeah, I pulled up Bow's game. She is completely dominating against Max Inlingworth. This is that's what? Right. How many pawns is Black up? Four. Too many. You can't even count them. Yes, yeah, four pawns and about to deliver a checkmate. So Rook F2 hits the knight, threatens Rook F1 mate. You can't really defend against both, so a res resignation just occurred, and that's a huge win for the Pandas because right now they move into the lead, right? Seven to six. Let's pull up the main scene again. And seven to six lead for the Pandas. I just pulled up the game between Chu Wei Chow and Raymond Song. And what is happening in this end game? Black is, is it even material? Yes. Yes. Even pawns, but that pawn on G3, what a weird construction of pawns, because normally you'd think we could snap that off. But the pawn on E4 is keeping my king at bay. Yeah, but the problem is you can't create any past pawns for black, where white's about to play c5. And once I play c5, even if I wasn't winning the c5 pawn back, black is left with all these double, isolated, ugly pawns. So um, let's say I go king f8, white can play the c5 move. You take on c5, I take back, you can take again, and my king comes in and starts mopping mm. up. Because your double e pawns are pretty much one pawn. So essentially white is up a pawn because the white queenside pawns are mobile, whereas black has these double isolated pawns that can't, your two isolated pawns can't push past a single pawn. That's really why we hate having isolated pawns here. So white's gonna win by either playing b4 and then c5 or c5 right away. And I think it's, yeah, just, it's over. So we're gonna have another super tight match there, right? Cause we're gonna have seven points for, it looks like uh, Kangaroos is gonna win in this one. And the other one we checked in, uh, Bao is gonna win for China, right? So. We're really gearing up for a very tight mo match here as well. Uh, we should check in on Miro. Okay, Miro. Ch Whoa, what's happening in this game? A wild affair where white is up in exchange, but the king is on e2. 
So I, I, I would assume that Black's king's in more danger with queen f8 mate looming. And black only has two checks, but as soon as you give me a check, my king goes up to e3, and you can't give me another check without losing your bishop on e4. So it looks like Chu Shang Yu is getting the better totally winning. of this GM totally on GM winning. battle. And that would mean eight points for China and kangaroos seven if the games shake out like we expect them to. So if you look, queen b5 did happen, king e3, and is Miro able to do anything at all here? He just resigned. Yep. Uh, so China's going to seven points. They just need another draw if the other two games shake out like we do. So um, we got to take a look at Shmirnov's game now. He will have to win this game to save the match. Wow. And his, as soon as I looked at his game, like his position looks amazing. I see a move G2 to G3 just played, and I see a bishop on C6 just staring down that long open diagonal and I want to figure out a way to get my queen on that diagonal so I can deliver a checkmate but black also can just play knight to g6 follow that with pawn to f4 and break open the f-file at the worst case scenario oh this looks stunning for the kangaroos so if things go as expected this match will actually be a drawn match very well played but you know, judging from the last match, things don't always go as expected, Robert. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> not. I mean, who expected Elshan Muradi Abadi to defeat Shakir and Mamajarov? And then, when the team was about to win the match, they end up losing, right? That's just unexpected things happen in the Pro Chess League. Yeah. And the game, about, wait. Bao won wait. her game. She, so they're actually, they're up. Is there, Bao won her game, yeah. yeah. So they're up right. eight to six right now. And. Um, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Is that right? Yeah, because okay. there are two games left, and both of them won, were won by Shang Du. Uh, we saw um, Bao win, and then we saw Xu Shang Yu beat Murashnishenko. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. Something happened. What happened? No, something happened. Bao lost. Bao lost? Was I looking at the game? She was winning. I think she was winning. Wait. Oh, wrong game. Wait, where is this bow game? Yeah. I'm very Wait, oh, that's, no, no, you're right. No. You're right, you're right. I don't, is it still underway? No, bow won her game. She was like, up four She won, pounds. okay. She, okay, I'm sorry. I think I was looking at the wrong colors. Yeah, no, you're, you're all good. I, I've done this so many times where I'm like, actually earlier today with Alexandra, I was saying someone won, and she's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, oh, whoops, wrong side. But she did the same thing. It's just, we're looking at so many different games, and each player plays with two times with each color. It's very easy to... You know, mix these up in our minds. So we have this. So to simplify it, then it's eight six in favor of China, the Chengdu Pandas, which means that kangaroos just have to win both games to get the draw and match. But it looks like they are going to win both games, right? Yes, because this end game with Raymond Song, he's now simply up a pawn, even though his material no material is not even equal here. White is up a pawn, and it looks like White's up a pawn because the pass B pawn. So yeah, and we're just going to break through. You you can't. You can't maintain the situation, and indeed, White has won that game. So now, all that has to be done for this match to be drawn and saved by the Kangaroos is for Shmirnov to win this really nice-looking position with Black. But if Bai Jinji saves it, he'll win the match for the Pandas. Whoa, and Shmirnov sacrificed a piece. So he better be following this up with a checkmate. Otherwise, Bai Jinji may be able to survive this, because that is quite a bit of material to go down for an attack, but knight f3 check is just screaming to be played here. Because after knight f3 check, you take me with your knight, I take with the g-pawn, and then I'm just going king h8, rook g8, and trying to go rook g2 even, and try to mate this king. Okay, rook g2 is not a good move, but um, just the point is I go king h8, rook g8, maybe rook g4, and start doubling on the g-file. I don't think white is gonna be able to survive this, but you really don't have any other choice. Agree. This looks like really tough for White to defend, but don't forget it is a blitz game and it might turn into a bullet game as Shmirnov continues to sink time. Knight of three check played. I'm just wanting, waiting for someone to say, is he going to ice him? You know, get a little Smirnoff ice reference going. <laughs> yeah, right. But well, do you have any injuries from the dodgeball? It could be a double entendre in your case. <laughs> my wrist does kind of hurt. My, my like forearm wrist, just throwing... We had three games yesterday, but each well, each three matches in each game you play match, you play five games. So, yeah, my uh, 
my wrist and form are hurting for sure. Might multitasking and get a really cold bottle of Schmirna. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Use it for your wrist and then take a few sips now and then. But what's going on here? G takes F3 and you mentioned it. King H8, Rook G8, invite the Rook to the party. Yeah, here it comes. So I would go King H1 if I'm white, but I don't see how that's going to stop my plan. Your Queen on B1, very far away from the action. Your Rook on A1, stuck there. If that Rook on A1 could get to G1, you'd be much happier. But that's a long journey. And well, if, as soon as you go Bishop H3, I can even go Queen H4 to kick your Bishop off that square. So this is looking very painful for Baijin Shi. So let's see if he can possibly do something. I don't see any moves. That's the problem, Jen. Is sometimes you're getting attacked, you at least see some sort of resources and ways to fend off your opponent's impending attack. Here, just like every move seems kind of obvious and straightforward, and I don't see a way to parry any of the threats. No, it looks like a great position for Anton Smirnov as White's position, White's pieces are really relegated to passivity and just watching this onslaught. Just like so frustrating, White's army is just looking at their king getting hunted down and they can't do anything about it. Yeah. It's a really nice game by Shmirnov, but not fun for Bai Jinchi. And speaking of relegation, Greg Shahadi says that he feels like in this division, all the teams are so good, nobody deserves to get relegated. But unfortunately, that fate will await two teams. Yep. Yeah, relegation is uh, going to be unfortunate for the teams who are stuck down there, but you know it's a part of the league. It's a good part of the league, in my opinion. I don't think it's going to happen to the pandas. I mean, they really <laughs> do have a lot of points, but it, the kangaroos are at risk too, and that's why this win is so important. Yeah, I guess they actually are. They're in fourth place coming into the match, but with the mechanics clearly getting better week by week and the hackers being the hackers, and once Hikaru Nakamura comes back for the sluggers, yeah, the kangaroos... If they don't keep up their good results, they may see themselves getting knocked down a tier or two into relegation territory. They better watch their tails, yep. Yep. <laughs> watch their tails. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I wish I had a, a follow-up there, but I'm not clever enough at you know, midnight after eight hours of consecutive chess streaming here. Yeah, I just I was just hoping I was just going out on a limb there. I don't know a whole lot about kangaroo anatomy, so I was trying to I was trying to think of something to say. Um, I mean, they have the pouches, right? That they and they have a tail. Yes. Yes, and, <laughs> and I, I'm trying to think what else I know about them. They kick really hard. That's I've seen videos of kangaroos kicking, and that doesn't seem like it's fun. Um, what else? I I wish I had more for you, but I, that's really. <laughs> All I got. Um, they hop. They yes, hop. yes, it's of like course. A kang little kangaroo hops. Are they the only they animals that hop? Hop, hop. Well, are they the only? No, they're not the only animal, but they might be the only large animal that hops. Because like bunnies hop, but they're small. So I, I wonder if that's true. I mean, people in the chat probably know better. Yeah, yeah. people in the chat have a lot of kangaroo wisdom coming out here. But how to stop mate? They don't have any wisdom for that. <laughs> yeah, there's a. <laughs> Huge problem right down the G file, and there's no phone number to call to help you out of this. So, trying to, trying to think what else I know about kangaroos. That's about it. Somebody says, if one punches you, you're dead. That's Mr. Sud. If one punches you, you're dead. Wow. And, yeah, wow. Okay, well, I've always wanted to go to Australia. But I, I've never been. I don't think you've been wanting to get punched by a kangaroo. Is. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not a good bait. Okay, so what does Bishop H3 do? Does that help anything here? It gives you access to the G file, but unfortunately you get access with your queen and not your rook. Right? If you could go rook to G1 and then rook to G3, you could probably try to secure your king side. But no, rook G8 just came in the board and yeah. This looks tough. I mean, queen h4 is my next move for black. Your bishop has nowhere to go. This is painful. It is. Queen h4, your rook's coming to g6. And just, it, it's just so sad that rook and a1, that knight on b c3, none of the pieces able to participate in the action here. b4 lashing out, trying to get in b5. Yeah, but that's a quite slow on that side of the board there. You know, you're trying to play b5 to kick this bishop off the well, diagonal. Queenie, is there queen e3 and f2 check? Oh, that looks and amazing. Queen e3, pawn takes f2, but you have e4. 
That's the thing you have to remember. Your pawn just went from f2 to e3, and so it can blockade with e4 just in the And then the we could time. play rook g1 check, but then we just trade it off too much. Yeah, but that's actually a tactic that we should keep an eye on, and one that I regrettably didn't even consider. But yes, this uh, queen takes e3, removing the f2 pawn is certainly something to keep an eye out on. And, okay, but queen h4 here, doesn't that just... What are you going to do about your bishop on h3? He just played b6. Okay, well, he's a very calm player, and he's just going to play b5, bishop b7, and say, try to attack my bishop one more time. Not possible. So, yeah, queen h4 is coming no matter what. There's nothing wrong with that. b5, bishop b7, and the problems all remain. And that's a classy move, because most people start calculating furiously... Queen e3, queen h4, rook g6, all these moves. I'm just like, hey, just chill. <laughs> What's a3? <Relax. laughs> Can you tell me the purpose of that move? Does that help the king side? <laughs> I mean, the position is just so lost anyway. But yeah, the move a3, I don't see how that's going to help. Queen a, queen b4, oh. the mystery is solved. Oh, OK. Now I'm kind of feeling it. But also, as, as soon as the second rook comes to g8, your queen takes e3. Uh, move works. So that's another tactic that's going to happen in this game. But okay, the bishop's already this. trapped. He lost on time. Bai Zhanqi lost on time. His position was awful. <laughs> Anton Shmirnov, great job. Ties up the match for the Kangaroos. As we mentioned, it's so crucial in this division. Every point counts, and certainly every match point counts. Yep. And so we see an 8 8 tie in this match. We saw the Topsy turvy battle between the hackers and the surfers. And so we finished this division's action on a great note. A really exciting day we had. And I'm going to pull up the uh, individual scoreboards just so we can see how each player did throughout the match. Smirnov went three and a half out of four. He was a hero for the Kangaroos. But uh, the, what, I, what sticks out to me on the scoreboard is 4 0, Thomas Beardson, the board four for the Blizzard. And 4 0, board three, Steven Zierk for the mechanics. They really helped their team uh, get some huge victories, lopsided affairs in their matchups, but 4-0 is a feat, especially when you're on the lower two boards. So the Pacific standings are updated, and it looks like, as I refresh my browser, we've got um, the San Jose Hackers just a point and a half behind the Kangaroos. Yeah, um, yeah they're, get, they're getting close there. That's crazy. I mean, it's just insane how the mechanics have been really rushing up the scoreboard in recent weeks as they struggled mightily early on. And, well, Daniel Naroditsky playing like that, Steven Zierk going 4-0 on the board three. Of course, that's going to help your team succeed. And actually, some big credit has to go to those San Jose Hacker top three boards because Vinesh Ravori had a tough day um, going zero out of four. He was outrated by like 400 points in every single game, so it's hard to fault him for that result, but Mohamed Jarob, even though he lost that last game, went 3 out of 4. Izoria seemed like a very steady presence in his 3 out of 4, and Christian Trilla, the hero in a sense, because that last round game against John Daniel Bryant, he was much better at the opening up a pawn, then played some iffy chess, and then all of a sudden in a blitz, in a bullet battle, I should say, he came out on top. So a good day to be a Hackers fan. Yes, and yeah, you certainly had your heart racing there because it didn't look like it was going to go their way, but how important it was because now they are in fifth place and very close to fourth place as the San Francisco Mechanics also um, leapfrog the Sluggers. What a division and what an incredible um, fun time I had calling this match. It's going to be an amazing last couple of weeks, and I think that... Um, the next few weeks are going to be really interesting and particularly uh, watching the specific division shake out. Yeah, for sure. So any final wrap-up thoughts here before we, uh, well, hopefully both go to bed. It's past midnight for the two of us here on the East Coast. Wow, just thanks, everybody. I mean, I can't believe what an eventful match. And we got over 10,000 viewers. We saw Elshan Moradibadi. Um, absolutely pull off an incredible upset against Mavi Yarev. And then we saw a, a, a bullet game that changed hands a million times. And we saw the incredible, what you think is going to be the game of the week by Daniel Naroditsky. So really today had everything. Yeah, it did. It was really phenomenal showing. I love the fact that those last two matches were so tight. And well, I think the 
matchup results seemed pretty fair when all was said and done. And Jen, it was a real pleasure doing commentary with you. I, you know, we had were very excited. I felt very excited throughout. We had over 10,000 people watching at certain moments. So it was a really great evening of commentary. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And big thank you again to Grandmaster Robert Hess for sticking with us for this double shift. Um, we appreciate you. All Bye, right. everyone. Bye. Thank you.